Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. People are struggling to have conversations and connect with others that they don't completely agree with on every topic. And I think that's probably the biggest problem that we need to try and solve is how after all this division and after all this separation, do we end up bringing people together again? And what does unity really look like? New Zealand faces some pretty big issues. First one is COVID in the aftermath. There's no getting away from that. Second is racial division. It's being ginned up and it's dangerous. Another issue that maybe people haven't got their head around yet is digital currency. What form does that take? Is it programmable? Will it be used to manipulate behaviour and patterns of behaviour? Those questions need to be asked and answered. How can you have fair, open, democratic government by people who are appointed? It's a ridiculous idea. And if that idea is taken to its zenith, then this country is in real trouble because democracy, one person, one vote, where every vote is of equal value, has got to be the foundation of a modern New Zealand. What's true, what's not true, how our kids are to be educated. And, you know, I have a great fear for the future. I think we know from history where this could end up. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place we crunch the political issues and cut through the politician's spin. Today's show promises to be an absolute banger. We have Chinese spying, trans rights fights, and the war on the woke. First up is Rachel Stewart to talk about a few topics, but focusing on protecting women's spaces, JK Rowling, and the necessity of men speaking up to protect women. Then I'll have a quick catch up with Shane Jones to talk about recent events and the focus of his speeches in Parliament. Shane's always a crack up, and I love our catch ups. Finally, though, we'll hear from Simon O'Connor and the recent news about the Chinese spying on him. Plus a few other topics that I know will interest him. Naturally, we'll hear from Cam's buddies and see what they have to say about the recent announcement by David Seymour providing up to $153 million for 50 charter schools. Of course, we'll have the mailbag to get your feedback too. Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Free speech, the cornerstone of democracy and the foundation of intellectual progress, is under threat. As we witness the rise of cancel culture and the imposition of what I like to call the thug's veto, it's crucial to understand the importance of preserving this fundamental right. And we're seeing this raise its head again and again. Individuals in Wellington, led by City Councillor Nikau Winera, are working to use the thug's veto to shut down Inflection Point, a gender-critical event to be held at a Tapapa venue this weekend, featuring speakers such as Bob McCrossery, Simon O'Connor, Rachel Stewart and Brian Tamaki. But public venues have a responsibility to respect everyone's speech rights, even if some find them offensive or provocative. Fortunately, there's now a case law that says publicly funded venues cannot discriminate on ideological viewpoints. Takina Events, though, needs to be reminded of their legal responsibility to uphold speech rights. But I note that Brian Tamaki, one of the speakers at this event, and he has every right to speak freely, is, however, ironically or indeed hypocritically, given that he's relying on these rights when he's recently worked to shut down the voices of those he disagrees with. Censorship tends to backfire, and when the thug's veto is used, we all lose. Inevitably, when we platform a diversity of views, 
some people will be offended by what's said. The right response to that is counter speech, deliberation, and debate, not cancellation. Free speech has to work both ways, otherwise, speech is not free. Takina events should know this and they should not bow to bullying and uphold those free speech rights. Free speech is the lifeblood of a free society, allowing individuals to exchange ideas challenge authority, and shape the course of history. It is a mechanism through which we hold our leaders accountable, expose corruption, and promote progress. The right to free speech is enshrined in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, a testament to its importance in safeguarding democracy. It is also in our own Bill of Rights Act. However, The rise of cancel culture and the thug's veto threatens to undermine this essential right. The thug's veto occurs when those who disagree with an idea or viewpoint use violence, intimidation, or threats to silence the speaker. This phenomenon stifles debate, discourages the exploration of new ideas, and fosters an atmosphere of fear and self-censorship. When we succumb to the thug's veto, we allow a small minority to dictate the terms of public discourse, effectively silencing the majority. This is a dangerous path, as it leads to the erosion of our democratic values and the suppression of diverse perspectives. To combat the thug's veto, we must stand united in our commitment to free speech. And this means defending the right of individuals to express their opinions regardless of how unpopular or controversial they may be. It also means rejecting the use of violence or intimidation as a means of suppressing opposing viewpoints. In conclusion, the importance of free speech cannot be overstated. It's the bedrock of democracy, the engine of progress, and the safeguard of our individual liberties. We must resist the thug's veto and defend the right to free speech, for it is only through open and honest discourse that we can truly advance as a society. Rachel Stewart is back on the show. This is going to be a frank discussion about the trans debate, cancel culture, standing up for women and women's rights. Now, Rachel is as subtle as a brick in the face, so this is going to be fun. She joins me now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Rachel. It's a pleasure to have you back. Thank you, Cam. Nice to be here. Uh, Things have got a bit heated, haven't they, in this space that we're talking about, especially around transgender issues and things like that. We've got the CAS report, the WPATH information that's been revealed by Michael Schellenberg. Then we've got Winston Peters uh, and his bathrooms bill. And, of course, we had Damien Grant come out after the CAS report was revealed saying perhaps people should be braver and actually challenge uh, a few of the things that are being said out there. Yeah, um, all of those things are, are very uh, helpful. Um, it's it's interesting if Damien's the last thing you mentioned, but uh, I, I, Damien and I have had some terribly heated arguments over this issue. For ye- for a few years, and I'm always have I was always having a dig at him, and and he. But you know, one thing about Damien is he sticks with you. He doesn't he doesn't just go all oh, that's into you and blocks you, and that's it. He's he's no Sean Plunkett. So you know, um, he stuck with it, and then one day he he got it, and and I said to him, finally, where have you been? And I was pretty mean, but you know, it was just like so many people, um, particularly men stand off to the side thinking it's not affecting them. And, of course, in many ways it does not, but in many ways it does. And and, and finally, I think when you realise what was happening to children, which we've been banging on about for years, us, you know, turfs, um, he finally got it. And I was very impressed um, that he did, and I'm pleased he did. But, you know, the other thing that sort of disappoints me slightly is that, and it doesn't matter because we're going to get there, and men are going to be the key to this, and I've always thought they probably would be. But it's a bit disappointing when you see, you know, Graham Linehan, who's great, he's done fantastic work, but he flies into New Zealand, the Free Speech Union, hook into him straight away. 
and suddenly they start to get a few things that they weren't getting before. So men listen to men, and it, and I I guess we all know that women all know that they don't listen to us as much. But this is the the thing that baffles me as a bloke is uh-huh. um, how on earth are we tolerating men telling women where they can go, what they can use, what you know, that, what they're going to be part of, all of that sort of thing. Because that, that's basically what it is. The, the trans agenda is a men's agenda to take over women's spaces, whether they're virtual or in reality. And I see it as a, as a proper bloke to say, no, <laughs> you know, we've had, a, we've had a, a women's liberation movement for decades that has been successful, has been brilliant. And now it's being taken away because some weak men want to be women. Yeah, and a, and a whole bunch of weak men sit back and say nothing. Sit back and say nothing. So, but you know, I think I think a lot of it is that the feminist movement has got a bad rap in the in the in the twenty twenty in twenty twenty four and and earlier. Um, a lot of people think that the feminist movement was evil and we caused our own demise. And you know, you could you could get into a huge uh, discussion about that. And I think there are some aspects of that that are possibly true. You could argue that about the pill. You know, you, there's many things mm. you could argue about. But in the end, I think feminism's been very successful, and but a lot of men have a very uh, bristly reaction to that. Uh, their hackles go up, and every time that woman was, they thought, I think, and Damien's admitted, you know, mm. um, that a lot of men just thought we were overcooking this and that it was not a big deal, really, and we were just being shrill, hysterical women. I don't really tend to the hysterical, and, and I've I've stuck with that, um, but I know right from wrong, and I and I could see where it was going. And so it's really good to finally get Damien on board and a few others, and and it will change the dynamics as, as along with this inflection point that we've got on Saturday. What astonishes me is not the the trans folk that are trying to be women. I mean that's bad enough, mm. but it's the trans allies that are women that enable this and excuse it. Of especially in in regards to sport, uh, mm. with women, uh, men competing in women's sport and taking gold medals that they don't deserve. Yeah, well, I think that's where we get back to the feminism. Feminism, feminism was a good thing up until the, maybe the nineties, and that's what I should have said. Uh, and then it got very skewy and went awry and became all about women could act like men and they can have one night stands and we can just do anything. And, and, you know, I mean, when I was driving, when I was the first woman train driver, there were these bumper stickers saying women can, women can do anything on cars, right? Yeah. In the 80s. And I remember just thinking that's Yeah, I remember bloody, those. They're just bloody ridiculous. I remember just thinking that's ridiculous. Well, that goes without saying, I thought. But mm. what I think's happened since then is that we've got a generation of women now mainly in their 40s, early 40s, mid 40s, uh, and late 30s, who believe that mantra, who think women can do anything, which means that we're probably physically actually as strong as they are. Some women actually think that. Um, and this is now, beca- feminism now has become absolutely bastardised. So, so what I'm saying, I guess, is that they just believe that trans women can take estrogen and somehow lower their testosterone levels and compete against women fairly. I mean, you'd have to be nuts to think that. Uh, well, well, that's it. You do have to be nuts. I mean, you know, I look at Riley Gaines and I think, wow, that's one strong woman. The 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 cost to her has been enormous, but the cost to you and and you know Annie O'Brien and and other people in New Zealand that have stood up against this nonsense has been enormous. Hmm. It has, but, you know, I wouldn't change anything. I couldn't change anything, Cam, because like you, I have a certain amount of integrity and, and I believe in what I believe and I don't care. They could, they can, they could take me down and cost me my livelihood and cost me my guns, but, although we put them back, but um, mm. but you st- I'm still there on Saturday talking and I'm never going to give up. And the picketers or the Antifa or who, who, who whoever who are already threatening now to turn up, yeah. um, they don't scare me. I'm not worried. Uh, maybe I should be, but, you know, we'll just keep going. We'll never give up. Well, they tried to shut down Avi Yemeni coming uh, to mm. Wellington, and it really was, in actual fact, a couple of sad old men driving around in a jalopy um, posting up some notices 
on the notice board and when uh, they were confronted with some blokes from the Man Up crew uh, of Brian Tamaki, they disappeared. So they're not that tough. They're not that yeah, they're tough. Like, but they're actually blokes that like beating up on women. Oh, yeah. Well, we saw that with Posey Parker, didn't we? And um, Yeah. Yeah, Antifa in Wellington, well, they just they just little creeps really to me. I mean, maybe I'm mis- or maybe I'm underestimating them. Maybe they'll that'll be the end of us on Saturday, but I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. You know, if you look at the people that are involved in inflection point, um, you know, there's some there's some some decent people that are uh, wrapped around that uh, that will provide support, especially now that Antifa or whatever they call themselves, you know, bunch of weirdos wearing masks, still mm-hmm. talking about a pandemic that never happened. It's funny because they do like wearing masks. Maybe that's a hangover from the from the pandemic. But um, yeah, mm. I don't understand why if they're so sure of their position around the trans issue, and this goes for TRAs as well, why they're always masked up. Just fascinates me. Well, I think they just um, want to get involved in the bash and don't want to get identified. That's what yes. it really is. They know there's going to be trouble, and so that they do that uh, just to to hide their faces because they're gutless cowards. Really, at the end yeah, of the day, they are. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I think, you know, the difference between this event and other events is this is m- m- a male organised, male led. And that gives me a sense of security that I think is is different from, you know, the Posey Parker event. Um, and men are stepping up. And I, I think it'll be a really good day. And, and I really hope New Zealanders start not being scared because you can't shut down everybody. You can't cancel everybody. It's impossible. Well, you know, I've got a good friend and she says to me that um, I just refuse to entertain their delusions. They cannot make me entertain their delusion that they're a woman. Yeah, no, it's not possible. And I don't know how anyone can, you know, I was I was watching Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying, his wife, uh, on uh, the Dad podcast. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name. And it's about, it was... Uh, on YouTube, and it was about the gender wars. And they were saying that the scary thing, of, and they're evolutionary biologists, I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, yep. And they were, and if not, you must look into them, and everyone, they're just the best. And they come at the world from that lens, which is evolutionary biology. So they were sitting there, and they were just saying, look, two plus two equals four. There are two sexes, male and female. And they're talking to this guy, and he's and I, and I and and she said, "What's really scary is that everybody's just pushed that aside to be inclusive and lovely and nice, and we just and this is the end of the world as we know it. If you if you don't have sex, if you don't have the sex of the male and the female, and you think everything is fluid, then we are in big trouble." <laughs> well, it, it's a very small uh, minority uh, with a very tiny mindset. Uh, but for some reason, they have a very vocal and active uh, voice out there that's amplified by a whole bunch of woke media. Yeah, and then you've got to ask yourself, well, what's behind it? And I guess then you get into the globalist thing and you've got to think to yourself, well, why is National not, you know, I have information that National, and I know that National will not come to this. They don't want a bar of it. I hope I'm proven wrong. I think there's pressure on them. But the, their MPs have been told to keep quiet. That's absolutely for sure. So why? And then you have to think, well, it's got to be about the global agenda and money and and pharma, big pharma. You've got to always follow the money, which is what my column was about in 2018. And here we are, you know, uh, six years later. And it's so evident that this is a, a this is being run by WHO, WEF. I hate to go back to these these what people call conspiracy theories, but that's it's exactly where it leads. Well, they're conspiracy facts now, aren't they? Because they are. we, we've seen the CAS report come out and then Michael Schellenberg's sterling work on W Path in the United States. This is really is uh, you know, to steal the title of, of the weekend's event, the inflection point, because the facts are coming out on the side of people like yourself and Annie O'Brien who've been saying, hang on a minute, uh, you know, th- there's something weird about this. There's something strange about that, and it does, in fact, look like a concerted, organised agenda for whatever reason. Yeah, money. It's always money. It's got to be money. Or, okay. well, yeah, that, and somehow they somehow there's something in, in people being completely, well, 
transhumanism's next. I mean, this has to be the the natural go to after this, doesn't it? If you can, if people are going to accept that humans can change sex, and I never will, and you never will, um, then they'll accept anything. And I, and I think that's the next uh, step. So it's a it, it's a hell of a pushback going on, and with the likes of J.K. Rowling and people with power like that, uh, it's really stepping up um, and just oh, she's amazing. Um, well, you know, th- she, she's we'll- in the news again, isn't she? Because there's been a, a bloke that's uh, been appointed a manager of a football club who claims that he's a woman now and um, is a, a referee as well, a rather burly-looking uh, woman if he is indeed a woman. But J.K. Rowling mocked the Daily Mail because the Daily Mail said, um, uh, you know, she said that he, he looks like a man. She said, no, I didn't say he looks like one. I said he is one. <laughs> That's that's it. She might write fantasy, but she lives in reality, you know. Um, actually, I saw a picture of him this morning as a man, as a referee. He's quite attractive, actually. I thought he was quite a good-looking man. I, I thought he was the sort of guy you'd like to go and have a beer with in the pub and look cheeky and lovely and look normal. And then suddenly, what the hell? So we yeah. have to conclude that porn got to him because this is a, lo- a lot of what drives it is porn. So Okay. I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah, have a think about that because there's been a lot of studies done. There's a bit of research to back that up that the more pornified uh, males become and watching certain porn videos, the more they want, they imagine themselves as women and what it's like to be a woman in that porn scene. And the next thing you know, and they talk about it. There's been interviews done with with a number of uh, trans women, and they talk about porn being the the key that that did it to them. So it's it's a lot of it as a kink. I mean, why else do they do drag queen story time? Why else are they in our toilets? Well, why do I, they want to be there? You know. Well, that's the thing. I, I can never understand, I, and I still don't. Who came up with the idea of drag queen story time, and why? Yeah. And like, what's well, the point of it? The genesis goes back to the oh, there's a really great article, very long article, which I must send you, and it's um. It's about the origins of it, and it goes back to the 50s, 60s, 70s was huge in in San Francisco and how drag queen story time's always been linked to pedophilia. Right. And there's a whole lot of data in there, and it's it's. I think it's in um, – just trying to think what it's in. Listen, some listeners will have, would have read it, but I will send you that link, Cam. It is such a good read, and it's so well done, and – and one accolades actually about the truth of the drag queen movement. It is very much pedophilia based. Well, we're looking at uh, the news at the moment of a, a pedophile, a bloke who's decided that he's now a she um, in prison, and mm. uh, and is uh, trying to sue the government because he reckons that he's been hard, hard done by 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 the correction system. Uh, and everything else, but the, the courts aren't having a bar of it. They're telling him, you know, you got your balls in a twist here, mate. But it's just a delusion, and this guy's just just playing along with it, and the media play along with it too. And the Herald just keeps calling him a she, even though he talk, you know, it talks extensively about his sex crimes against, yeah. you know, um, and they call him a she. What sort of, you know, it's like rape uh, rapists. They get they go to they go to court in New Zealand, and the judge calls them she, and they've raped some woman. Imagine. The, the victim standing there listening to this judge say, you must show, show respect and call him she after she's been raped by him. I mean, I find that absolutely appalling. No. And I really thought by now, and I'm getting pretty annoyed with National Have to, I'm getting very anti-CAM, um, that they have this opportunity to, um, you've been ahead of this one, but they've had this <laughs> yeah. opportunity to step up here and they are not doing it. In fact, they're actively ignoring this and trying, hoping it will go away. Will it? Christopher Luxon, if you're listening, I'm sure you're not, but if you were to, we're never going away, mate. Oh, they listen to me. Trust me, they listen. Okay. <laughs> you know, they, Good. they they read and they listen. And but the, you know, I'm actually happy though. Well, well, not necessarily happy. I'm I'm ambivalent to national taking a a, a quiet approach to this or a silent approach because it just hands a, a New Zealand first. And Winston Peters and Shane Jones, a mm. massive cudgel that they can use to drive a wedge to peel off a few more votes for them, uh, for yep. people who believe in politicians should stand for something. And yeah, that you know, true. that's the thing. Christopher Luxon actually doesn't stand for anything. He's 
wetter than an otter's pocket. And he, you only have to look at the polls to see that national isn't going up. They aren't going down either, but they're stagnating. Uh, they should be going up, but it's, it's the minor parties that are going up uh, as a result of standing up for things that are sensible. And Winston Peters' bill that he uh, introduced to Parliament last week um, is exactly that. And, of course, the little whoopsie from um, Northcote who didn't get elected uh, but is now in on the list, Shannon Halbert, uh, mm. he's come out with his little whinging, mealy-mouthed excuses standing up for what he calls trans rights. And I, and yeah. I just and I just think if the Labour Party wants to die in a ditch over letting men use women's uh, bathrooms, then let them, then let them and see where that ends up. Yeah, I watched and I thought the gall of you, mate, the gall of you, a homosexual male who thinks it's okay to tell women who they should allow into their spaces, the gall of that guy. Um, and he doesn't see it. He doesn't see the misogyny just oozing out of every pore in himself. He just doesn't get it. And well, unfortunately, some gay men are, are very misogynist, We've, we, and it, some aren't, but many are, and it's a real concern to hear that. Yeah, Yeah, but as I said, let them do it, because there's 50% of the population who actually are women, and yes. like the good old-fashioned types, you know, like mm. proper women, and, yeah. and, <laughs> and they vote. And they're going to look at the Labour Party and go, yeah, no, we don't want blokes in our bathrooms. We yeah, don't but want, like, you, we, yeah, we but don't like want... you say, there's a lot of those women that are now, you know, on the side of the trannies. So, you know, it worries me that we've got this generation of women in their 40s, roughly, white women particularly, uh, who who just accept this stuff. So I worry about that, but I hope it turns before the next election anyway. Yeah, you know, there was a time in the, in the dim, dark past, but it's not that far away that we can't remember it. If you were a bloke and you tipped up into the into the women's uh, changing rooms, that you probably got a hiding uh, mm. for for it, and then the police called, and and mm. now the police are called, and they'd be separating men and then trying to lecture the women how they need to be more inclusive. Yes, I have a fear about this. I have a fear that I'm going to run into Bomber Bradbury um, in the toilets one day. Well, he said he he's going to. He said he's going to yeah. do that. Yeah, good. I hope it's Just, me in that toilet. Just shows him what shows us what a creep he is. He's a creep, and um, I think a lot of people have known that for a while. But you know, there it is. And I'm afraid, being the personality that I am, uh, that I would any man in a toilet, and me, it would be it wouldn't be good. And I would do everything to get that man out of there. And you know what would happen to me though, Cam? I'd be yeah, you'd, get pro- and, you'd be prosecuted. You'd have yeah, your guns taken. You'd, you're not a fit and yeah. proper person because. Yeah because you're mean and you're not inclusive. That's it. So I tend not to go to public toilets now because I don't ever want to be put in that position, but I certainly talk to women that do go to public toilets and, and are put in that position, and it's getting trickier and trickier. Well, you could take your, sure. you could go take your hawk and they're used to hunting small um, targets, aren't they? <laughs> I guess, but, yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> it's a difficult. It's a very. It's a very difficult one. I. But I just struggle to see why people can't see what we're seeing, which is this is just blatantly wrong. But well, I think you're right, though. You know, back at the start of of this interview, you said it, it's going to require men to stand up. It is, and, and men to say, "No, enough. Stop. You're being stupid." I mean, I mean, put it in, into context. Right? If you had a nine year old kid who came up to you and said, "Look, Dad." Uh, I really want to get hammered tonight. You've got some good scotch there. Let's crack the cap off that and uh, get hammered. You'd give them a clip around the ear and send them to their room, wouldn't you? Well, you'd like to think so. If your nine-year-old came up to you and said, look, Dad, it's time I lost my virginity. Can you take me to a whorehouse? You'd give them a clip and send them to their room. But you get a nine-year-old who says, oh, Dad, I want to be a girl. And they go, oh, okay, darling. Well, we'll here, take these drugs. See, yeah. see how nuts it is? Yeah, it's nuts. And it's you know? child abuse. It's child abuse. Yeah, why would you, know, you we've do got, that to your child? Yeah, well, transhausen's by proxy, they call it now, instead of Munchausen's by proxy. Oh, transhausen's by proxy. Oh, that's so the really good. That's yeah, really the mothers, good. Yeah, the mothers sit there and they, in the interviews, and they go, oh, I've always known my, my boy is a, 
as a girl and yes and you know and then they get all the bloody attention and it just makes you want to vomit it really does and I think it's a real thing and I think mothers are really basking in that and I don't have any sympathy for any woman who comes out and says my child's trans and writes big stories about it and this and stuff or wherever it just makes me want to throw up you're a terrible well, mother well that's the thing is we see the media uh ingratiating themselves not just on this issue you, you take uh, you know, there was an article in Stuff the other day that apparently uh, Maori women giving birth uh, uh, four times more likely to have all sorts of other problems and therefore as a result of colonialism, it's the white person's fault and we need to fix it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, normal. This is uh, normal now. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then you get the stories about, oh, look, I've, I've tattooed my chin and now I feel like a proper Maori. It's just bollocks that's being shoved down everybody's throat. Uh, that is, this is normal, that this is, and it's crazy stuff. And you sit there and think, well, really, have you got any proof of that? What's your empirical evidence to support that? You know, mm. uh, you, know you could get a kid come up and say, I want to be a Sith Lord. You're going to say, oh, that's a nice story, dear. Run along, read your Star Wars books. But, but, you know, and that's how you should treat it. A kid coming up and saying, oh, Dad, I want to be a girl. No, you don't. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but so, but I know we've got to entertain the delusion from a nine year old. Yeah. Well, why are we entertaining it? And why are parents entertaining it? And I really hope that a lot of parents are sitting around thinking, and, and a lot of people have the luxury of it not happening to them. Their kids aren't showing signs of being trans. And so they carry on about inclusivity and diversity. And, but, you know, they want to be liked. It's a big virtue, sign virtue signaling Olympics. And it's just, it, to me, I don't care if you like me or you don't. I'm just going to keep saying what, what is wrong here. It's, it's just basic biology. It is basic humanity. It is basic decency not to drug your kids, cut bits off, castrate them. And I don't care. And, and people don't want to look into it too much, too, too deep because they don't want to know. They just want to be kind. And I find that it's, it's a, it's a mind virus. It really is. Well, it has infected um, the media because I know of one journalist, particularly nasty journalist, I must say. Uh, I have a personal beef with him, but um, a, this this eliminates about nobody. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm the same. Yeah, but 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 his child's transitioning, and there's another journalist at Newsroom, and his child's transitioning. And so that's when you actually see that see articles in the Herald and newsroom and things about this agenda, you think, well, hang on a second, you're all part of this. You're you're yeah. validating your decisions as a parent by normalizing this it with, with stories. Yeah. Actually, interesting. Helen Joyce, who wrote Trans, the book, which is such a great read. It's probably the the best read about the whole movement that came out about three or four years ago. She was in a few a few months ago saying um, the problem with turning this whole movement over is going to be those parents that thought that believed that they did the right thing are never going to admit they did the wrong thing because who wants to admit that they they stuffed up their own children and they will hang into the death and they will never accept that they've they've made a mistake and they're going to be the the last thing to topple because you never want to think that you did something to your children that was absolutely wrong. And I think she's got an abs a very good point. Yeah, I, I think yeah. she has. I mean, if you look at the unwillingness of people to look at the evidence that's now before us about the the COVID vaccines, mm -hmm. that's that's coming out on a daily basis, where people like like ourselves here at RCR, like yourself, who said, uh, you know, that this is wrong. There's something wrong with this. We shouldn't be doing this. We're all called nutters. Uh, we're all called fruitcakes, uh, conspiracy theorists. Well, we actually were right, but but everyone was so invested in pushing that for whatever reason that mm -hmm. for them to actually admit that they got it wrong uh, is is going to be a huge thing. And we haven't yet. I think we just saw the start of it uh, this week with uh, uh, was it Chris Cuomo. Uh, coming out and you know, CNN spokesman saying, well, I'm vaccine injured. And it's going to take people you know, like that to come out and say that sort of thing. And we need to do that on the trans uh, argument as well. But mm -hmm. it's going to, like, and then the way people, someone said to me the other day on the weekend, well, what's it going to take for people to realize that the, these vaccines were bad? 
And I said, it's going to take an All Black to drop dead on the field. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Or, or an All Black to come out and say, this is the worst thing I ever did. It, it curtailed my career. I wish I'd never done it. Yeah, and, and then be- people, yeah, and there must be consequences. But until that time, uh, we're going to see the same th- the same thing. Just you know, we're going to have media that keep on pushing that that you know, people go down the rabbit holes. Um, we're going to have the media pushing things that if you are against trans people, that you're uh, a nasty person, you're not inclusive. Uh, all of these things. It's a it's a narrative that will only crack once the people who have got the power to voice those things crack themselves. Yes. And I, and, and I think the beginnings are happening with the trans movement, I do. Um, oh, I, I do too. I mean, the CAS yeah. report is was, is huge. W, huge. The W Path revelations is huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got J.K. Rowling, who's got more money than a bull can shit, uh, who doesn't care uh, if they try and boycott or do anything to, to hurt. They can't hurt her because she's no. got so much money they can't hurt her, so she just keeps on doing it. And, she, and she's staring down the government and their edicts and their hate speech yes. laws as well. Yes, yes, because, on, yeah. because yeah. she she's she's too big to fail. And it's that's, fail. it's like Elon Musk as well. He's too big to fail. And yeah. so he can he can go to war with the Australian government and beat them over free speech because he can. Mm. And he does. And mm. you have to admire people who have principles. Yeah, you do. Because it can cost you, you know. Principles are very expensive. I remember Stephen Frank saying that to me when I first contacted him after my guns went. You know, he said, well, having principles is very expensive, isn't it, Rach? I said, yeah. And, you know, it's true. And, and I, again, wouldn't change anything. But the vindication that I think will come one day will be very nice. I'm starting to smile a bit more about this. We're starting to be, you know, we're starting to be vindicated, which is which is a nice feeling. Yeah, it, it is. it is a nice feeling. But we don't need to do the I told you so's because no. their shame is bad enough for them as it is. Well, I hope so. I noticed that there's a few journalists that uh, out there that usually hammer on, you know, about the trans thing constantly and, you know, run me down and all the rest still go on, even after all these years. Um, yeah, you, you, that- should, you should invite them all down for a for a hawking weekend and see – yeah, that'll separate the men from the boys, so they to speak. They wouldn't come, mate. They wouldn't come. I would. Just, yeah, good on you. Well, they're too scared of me. But, you know, there's a number of them that just uh, starting to pull their horns in and go pretty quiet lately. Because I think the cash report, if you read it from top to toe, which is what Damien did, and I've done bits of it, um, but not all of it because, you know, it's the same old stuff, which we kind of knew, but it's very interesting report. Once you read that thing from top to toe, you cannot – you just and they what they do is they just don't read it. They just turn their cheeks and look and look the other way. Again, it's a, there's some anal- you know um, similarities between the vaccine issue. The information that's coming out is so big that it's easier to stick your head in the sand or your fingers in your ears and scream la 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 la. But that eventually ends. You become hoarse or you get tired from holding your fingers in your ears, and eventually you will have to listen and you will have to speak out. Yeah. The tide will turn on this. The tsunami wave's coming in and it's going to happen, and I'm just so here for it. I can't believe it. Now, you're uh, you're busy this weekend, aren't you, with this? Uh, yes. Uh, what's it called? Inflection point. Yeah. Just one of the speakers. Um, there's a whole bunch. Uh, you know, Bob McCroskey and uh, there's uh, Simon Brian O'Connor. Tamaki. Simon O'Connor, I'm very pleased to see Simon there. Yeah. Um, uh, the Landy sisters, me, uh, Jennifer Bielek, who I based a lot of my column on in 2018 and still got told by the media council I was wrong, but she was always right and I was right too uh, in terms of the puberty blockers and, and those th- those things. Then the uh, then there's a detransition of flying in from Australia. Can't think of a name. Of, uh, Mia Jeffries, maybe. It's her yeah. name. She's been through the absolute mill. So she's going to be interviewed by Annie O'Brien, which is great. Um, so we'll all be we'll all be there. I've missed people out. I'm sorry, but um, we'll all be there. Um, and I'm really pleased to be there with the Christians. The gays and the Christians unite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So whereabouts is this inflection point? Uh, Tokina Centre in Cable Street in Wellington. Tokina, Tokina Conference Centre, I think. Twenty dollars a ticket. They they're going pretty fast now. Uh, there's six hundred seats. So let's see where we can fill them up. There may be a live stream, um, which you may pay something for. 
Uh, the tickets are only 20 bucks, but the live stream may be, I don't know, less than that. I just say to everybody who can't come, and a lot of people aren't based in Wellington and want to hear what we've got to say, uh, unsilenced we are, so um, tune on in. But I think it'll be – it's the first time this kind of event has happened, although already the Tekina Centre is getting very nervous and doing silly things, but they can't actually stop this. And um, there will be politicians there, I believe, so I'd, I'd be very careful if I were them. Well, there's going to be a few rowdies, the Poniki anti-fascists who seem rather fascist to me. They always seem to wear black and like waving yeah. red flags around. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. I can't it, wait to meet them. Yeah, I, I think you'd probably scare them. I don't know, but I, I'm, I, I won't be, I won't be trying to bait them. But I certainly can't wait to see them in the flesh because, yeah, I just can't believe these people exist. Really, these little wowsers. <laughs> But yeah. They're out there. They're out yeah. there, all right? Now, all they do is exist to uh, silence other people because they don't want the truth coming out. Yeah, and this no debate business, no debate, no debate. Well, guess what? We're bloody having one, guys. Yeah, we're having one whether you like it or not. That's right. Yeah. I noticed they call it a hateful event. Yes, I saw that. Mm. It's all hateful. I'm so, we're all so hateful. Yeah. I mean, they just, it's, it, there's so much of this movement is incredibly linguistic in that they turn words against you, the woke movement, I should say, but the trans movement too. They will use your words, they twist them and use the very thing that they are, they use against the people that are trying to do some good in the world. Um, I consider the hateful people to be the ones outside um, chanting and carrying on and trying to stop us from speaking. That to me is hateful. Well, it's, and the it's, Wellington it's, City Council is complicit in this, and I'm pretty sure that they're going to be up to something too. They better be bloody careful what they do because it's it's um, like the people pushing for hate speech, hate speech legislation, particularly Muslims, right? They 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 hate the Western ideals, mm. they hate liberalism, they hate your religion, they hate Jews, they hate Christians. They hate and homosexuals. They, they especially hate Israel and anything to do with it. Hate homosexuals, hmm. so they've, they've, their entire ideology is filled with hate. Yes, and yet they lobby for hate speech laws because people are saying mean things about mean but true things about Islam. Yeah, and, and Muslims. Enough. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I've had people say, "Oh, we need to oppose hate speech legislation." I said, "No, we don't. We need to let it happen, and then we can turn it on them." Yeah, you might be, but you know, it doesn't look like it's going to happen here now, which is a, which is a which win. is good. Yeah, which is it's good. A- but yeah, you know, they don't even know what they don't know because boy, changes a government can change things. That's for sure. The what the torment I got, through, and that's really what I'm talking about is uh, on Saturday is the torment that I went through at the hands of the state. Actually, mm. uh, I want people to know that the state, and in this my case, the police that was uh, and that was pushed through by certain Labour people too, um, government people, the state can torment you enormously and we need to know the consequences of that. I know it all too well, Rachel. I I know you do. (laughs) But the state is, yeah. What I've found is the best defence against the state doing that is to have a louder voice. Yeah. Because if you're quiet, then they win. And if you have a loud voice and you make it, painful for them to do what they're doing, mm. then they won't do it. No, you're right. And and in the case, in my case, it costs money and time and effort and yours too. Mm. But we were vindicated and it was worth it. Um, and you just have to keep going. You can't sit back and let the state just kick your door in and do what they want to do just because someone told them in government that they wanted to make an example of you. You know. Yeah, I mean, Ronald Reagan, I mean, I, I harp on about this almost every show. Ronald Reagan said the nine most... Um, the nine words that people fear the most in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, the, when you when the police come calling, they're not your friends. No. No, I've learnt that. And I, uh, I, my opinion of the New Zealand police is, uh, is very different from, from how it used to be. Um, I, you know, I'd been struggling for a while with some of the things that were going on, but when they come to my door, and did what they did. And then a week later came with a taser and looked like they were going to taser me because someone said that I was about to kill myself. And I asked him, oh, who's that? And he said, oh, we can't reveal our sources. Fortunately, I had people here 
uh, having dinner, but there was one in the camellia bush with her hand on a taser. I think that if no one had been here, they would have tasered me and well, said that I'd resisted. I had exactly the same issue. I had two police turn up to my house yeah. and they said, uh, you know, knocked on the door and they said, oh, we're here to inspect your, your gun safe. And I said, well, you've already done that. And um, he said, oh, no, we, we need to inspect your gun safe. I said, oh, okay. Have you made an appointment? Well, no. I said, well, you're the police. You should know the law. You haven't made an appointment. Oh, come on, we're here now. I said, I'm busy. Of course, that's and changed the, now, though. Yeah, that well, it does, especially if you're a collector as well, like me. They can they can come in, but they have Anytime. to still be yeah. they still have to be reasonable. Right? They can't come at yeah. four in the morning. Okay, no. But but at that time, uh, you know, I said I'm busy, and then the cop said to me, well, "Well, what are you busy doing?" I said, "I'm talking to two idiots about the law." <laughs> now, yeah. now get now get in your car and go away. Now, most people in my position. Uh, with a firearms license would comply with the police because they don't want to have their firearms license taken away because the police decided to, you know, get a bit upset with you. But the law's the law. And I insisted they follow the law and they didn't like it. Yeah. Um, but but that set a, a benchmark. So any interactions I have with the police since then, they already know that that's in the in there because before they come to see you, they go and look up everything in there and they see that, oh, okay, this guy insists on following the law. Mm. So my interactions are, are much more pleasant now. I have because, a feeling that that law's changed, though, Cam, with this new firearms thing. They can now come any time and ask to see your guns. Uh, yeah, but it has to be a reasonable time. Right? They, yeah, they what time of the day was it for you? Well, that was 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, mine was too, roughly, yeah. Yeah. They like to do that, you know, when you're in your nighty or in your pyjamas or something like that. Yeah. I was. Not my nighty, but pyjamas, and I was <laughs> fast asleep, actually. It was a frosty morning, and I was so cold. And these guys are in my house. The heat is not going. I'm absolutely freezing. And I was shaking. I was shaking with cold, but I was also shaking with absolute shock, mm. I think, and rage that they'd done that six weeks after a tweet, you know. Well, it was subsequently and, I found out that that visit – was uh, as a result of a false uh, warning to the police that I was going to try and kill myself. That, ah, same. From the second one was me too. Someone did it to me too. Yeah, they they yeah. do that so that you'll react badly and then they can tase you or shoot you. Yeah, and that's that, exactly what it felt like. That that's yeah. that's the tactic out of the United States. Um, uh, they call it swatting. Yeah, where yeah. they they call in and and the police act to protect themselves. Because if if they if they believe that there's a mental health issue, this yeah. person could be in a position where they can shoot me. So they shoot you first, That's and then it. deal with it afterwards. And that is a tactic that has been used against me. And you have now confirmed it's been used against you. It has. And she had her hand on her taser, and I'm looking at them. Fortunately, at the same time, it's like seven o'clock at night. At the same time, a, a friend of mine's walking up the drive, and he's coming for dinner. Yeah. And he sees all of this, and he walks up and stand, just stands there and looks at them while they're doing it. And I said, so someone told you I'm self-harming? And they said, yes. Can you tell me who? And he said, we don't reveal our sources. I thought the word source was a very good word. Mm. Um, and I said, well, I'm having a self-harming party right now. Come on in, dinner party. Come on in. <laughs> and they said, oh, oh, we got the wrong information. Goodbye. Yeah. But that was, of course, if they can use the mental health card, then you'll never That's get right. your guns back. Yeah. Well, well, so, well, they can lock you up. Yeah, so for, someone for rang several in days. Or, yeah, yeah. I say someone rang in, but considering how many trans police there are now, and mm. we've discovered, um, who knows? Because I would say that the the trans side of it were probably just. I mean, you can do what you want. Your police are just a big gang, or you can make up a lot of shit. Really, it's, there's no way that they can't. They well, could have shot me, and if no one was here, no one would know what happened. I don't know if you've done it, but I I did it, and I do it quite regularly now is I use the Privacy Act and I ask for everything that's in my file with the police, including the QID numbers of people who have accessed my file. Okay. And I think, you, I think you'll find it'll be very astonishing, Rachel. I because, need to do that. I haven't. Because when I did it a couple of years ago, I found that there were 742 police had accessed my file. Wow. No, that's that's that that's just busybody nosies 
see me in the news. Oh, let's go and look them up on our system. That's what wow. that is. That's incredible. It's just like the nurses accessing the, you know, the who the guy was that had the eels that they had to pull out of his rectum. Remember that? Wrecked him, it damn near killed him. <laughs> <laughs> he was very ill. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, Rachel, I'd better let you go. <laughs> Okay, well, it's really good to talk to you, and um, it would it be good if you were coming down to Wellington on Saturday? But I guess you're not. No, I've got a. I've actually got a gun auction to go to. Oh, that's more important. Oh Dead yes, right. yeah, yeah. Fully automatic weapons, belt-fed weapons. That's the way to go. <laughs> God, don't get me started. All right. Well, nice talking to you. Okay, Rachel. Thank you very much. Cool. Wasn't it interesting that Rachel said we're at the point where blokes. Proper blokes, not those effeminate, whoopsie, soy latte drinking types, need to stand up and say something about protecting women and women's spaces from men who would like us to believe their delusions. She's right. We do. Tell me your thoughts on what Rachel Stewart had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Check out our brand new RCR Foundation Members Club. Go to realitycheck.radio slash members and join now. Guess who's next on the show? Shane Jones. He's back. I've managed to catch him between meetings. Let's see what he has to say about last week in the House, recent developments on the Waitangi Tribunal and his green mannequins. Shane's on the line from Nelson now, so let's get chatting. Welcome back to The Crunch, Shane Jones. It's uh, good to have you back on, and we're back on air. This is the second week we're back on air, and uh, good to have you back for our, our normal catch-up. No, no, pleasure to be here from sunny Nelson in the South Island, where I'm meeting and uh, trading ideas with the various interests that comprise aquaculture and fishing. And what is arguably fishing capital? Well, you've been um, hammering a few of the uh, green wombles in Parliament about precisely this sort of thing, using our natural resources that God gave us uh, to enrich the country in general rather than what they pre- prescribe, which is misery and poverty. Yeah, okay. I have deployed some colourful language, uh, dismissing them as munchkins and suggesting that they're more interest, uh, their, their, their economics is more related to unicorn kissing than the harsh reality of how you dig the country out of the, the rut that we're in. But if it has the effect of uh, displaying to the public that there is a new regime, that we have different priorities, and we're not going to acquiesce with this shapeless, formless rhetoric that's got actually no content and offers no practical hope for the Kiwis who on a regular basis are packing up and buggering off to Aussie. Well, that's the thing. The economy in Australia, even though it's you know faltering like many of the economies around the world, the opportunities there uh, seem to be a lot more available to anybody uh, and along with easily accessible things like housing and infrastructure and, and all the rest of it that goes with it. It's almost like we've beggared ourselves as a nation and then uh, seem to be screaming that we can do better by taxing ourselves more. Well, look, uh, housing in some parts of Australia is extraordinarily affordable. I've got quite a lot of whanau up there. Indeed, one of my mokopuna, she's back to the 10-year-old, back for a few days, and uh, the quality of life that her and her, um, her family are enjoying over there uh, is unlikely to cause them to want to come back home anytime soon. The most important thing, however, is we've tied ourselves up in a system of resource management and environmental management that's dominated by a caste of Brahmins. Mm. And once we break their hold and get more pragmatic and practical people and decision makers involved, then we're going to be able to free up land to reduce the cost of sections, reduce the cost of housing provision. But at the moment, even when you get a consent for a big project in New Zealand, it's often saddled with so many conditions, whether it's a wind farm, a minerals play, a development, an aqua farm. And of course, 
politicians no longer make these decisions. We delegate them by and large down to these grandees on these committees who are never held uh, accountable. Look, I say this to you. Mm. The Ruatani for Dam collapsed on the basis of one decision maker in the Supreme Court. Yep. Now, I recall Bill English uh, venting his spleen when that decision came out uh, somewhere around the 2017 election. One decision maker in the Supreme Court. So who's got the greater moral authority or legitimacy, one single jurist or an entire uh, array of personalities that gone have been out and tested their fitness in the front of the um, gays of their fellow New Zealanders. That's why I'm such an enthusiast for maintaining ministerial oversight as to the fast track process. But I have to admit it is before the select committee and who knows um, how that may change. But if people ever doubt, well, why is Shane so hard line on maintaining ministerial oversight? Look no further than some of the decisions, including three unelected, unknown, obscure, ill-suited people turning down the offshore fishing initiative of Ngaitahu down in Southland, what that was supported by every single Southlander who had an inclination to pay attention. Pretty, pretty straightforward, mate. But we're seeing these grandees in these positions almost trying to write law without bothering to stand for parliament. And we saw that on Monday afternoon when uh, the Court of Appeal decided that they knew better and um, and that is okay for the Waikatangi Tribunal, of which there is not a single judge sitting on it, to be able to call ministers at their whim to harangue them about public policy that voters voted for. Yeah, I think it's a deep constitutional issue. MMP is always going to throw up a host of policy outcomes that we campaigned on as minor parties, and it's almost as if the established order which has been agreed to by the cast of lawyers and various other stakeholders who attend these hearings at the Waitangi Tribunal, they are offended by the ideas we're bringing. Well, we campaign on having a review and resetting the writ of the Waitangi Tribunal. Whether people like it or not, I went with my leader to, 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 to drafty halls and the nooks and crannies of what passes for the entire electorate in New Zealand. We're also going to change the law which unfortunately has enabled the Court of Appeal to expand the writ and expand the uh, purpose of the seabed and foreshore legislation. And we also, we campaigned on addressing uh, which of these ongoing uh, Treaty of Waitangi principle statements in law ought to remain. Now, I know that all of that is offensive to the caste of Brahmins who seek to order our constitutional um, direction of travel. Well, no, sorry. Uh, we stood for office. That's what we were elected to do. And admittedly, it is taking a tad longer than I would have liked, but that's what we're going to deliver on. And I know it's controversial, but at the end of the day, Parliament is sovereign. And if you want to go to Parliament, stand for office. Well, we, we've got some, you know, a commentator out there. I mean, I, I call all of these lawyers and people that sit there and going to the tribunal on everything that they can dream up with kind of troffers. You know, they're, 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 they're sort of trotted deep in the trough. Uh, Christopher Finlayson is one of those who is a poacher turned gamekeeper and, uh, and, and then gone back to being a poacher again. Uh, and he's out there, you know, um, back chatting anything that you or Winston says uh, basically trying to say that you're anti-democratic and uh, and and against Maori while he's got his trotters in the in the trough himself. Well, what we're going to do is we're working effectively with our coalition partners, and uh, we don't underestimate the size of the task. But uh, Winston's had a long period of time where he has railed against this creep of uh, judicial activism and and quite frankly, mission creep at the Waitangi Tribunal. And now I know when I carry on, I annoy some of my relations there at the tribunal, but legitimate authority has to be at the end of the day tested by the will of the people. And I don't care if that sounds trite, but that's how the system works. And that's why we really have to address 
what is the role going forward in the next 50 years of the Waitangi Tribunal? In what manner or form should it exist? And who empowered it to be something akin to the House of Lords, fulfilling a role almost like uh, rejecting or putting uh, our policy outcomes uh, created through a democratic process through a cultural kind of decolonization sieve? Is there any need for the tribunal? I mean, we're just about settled everything as far as you can settle anything in Maoridom. There's only really Napui left as as major settlements. Everything else is dreamed up since the settlements, uh, like this necessity or requirement of the tribunal to question a minister over government policy. Um, these are dreamed up, imagined grievances uh, as opposed to real grievances, which is what it was originally set up to deal with. Yeah, only the Ngāpuhi claim remains outstanding, and we're going to have to get uh, focused along with Goldie and bring that to heel. Uh, sadly, uh, it's blighted by the decision of the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, which uh, basically agreed that the Ngāpuhi people didn't cede sovereignty. What on earth that's got to do with the daily travails of Rangi and Hinemoa living in Whangarei, Kaikoi, Paihia is beyond me, but there you go, um, we're going to have to deal with that. But look, a review of the tribunal has to take an expansive approach and pair it back to what role represents value. But I'm deeply disturbed by the notion that everything we campaign on, which w- will offend some people, I mean, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the green policy that they campaigned on around trans rights, et cetera, it offended me. But mm. I would be prepared to tolerate the fact, well, that's democracy. You win some, you lose some, rather than trot off to the Waitangi Tribunal and haul one day possibly even me up. In fact, I pray for the day that they uh, <laughs> seek to subpoena me to the Waitangi Tribunal. Well, Winston- anyway, mate, I've... Uh, I can see people gathering around outside to talk to the Minister of uh, Fisheries. I I better sort of start to uh, move on. But if there's anything else that we want to urgently court it all about, uh, let's do it, and then I've got to go. Well, we'll just do it in another time, um, Shane. It's always a pleasure having you on The Crunch, and I know you're a busy man, but I appreciate your time talking to us and to, to our listeners. Uh, you always have something interesting to say. <laughs> Kia ora. Thank you very much. Bye, Thank folks. you. Bye. My word, the producers are going to be creating quite a few shareables out of that 10 minutes or so. What do you reckon? Let me know your thoughts by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. One of my favourite interviews I've ever done was with Simon O'Connor. When it was revealed that the Chinese government had been spying on him, I thought it would be a great opportunity to get him back on to talk about that and a few other things. Simon's on the line now, so let's have a conversation. Simon O'Connor, welcome back to The Crunch and welcome back to Reality Check Radio being back on air. And thank you for your support uh, on social media during our hiatus, as I like to call it. Well, great to rejoin you, Cam. I must say I got lots of lovely feedback about your interview. But again, congratulations to you and the wider team for getting back on air. I know there are a lot of Kiwis and actually people overseas too looking forward to hearing your shows again. Yeah, I got a lovely email from a fan who listens in Japan. He's a car buyer and he sits in the auctions buying cars to come into New Zealand you know, on a Saturday, and he said he, he listens to the replays of The Crunch every Saturday while he's buying cars, which was kind of nice of him to say that. That's fantastic. Maybe if he's listening, he could uh, could buy you a really nice car as sort of a, a thank you <laughs> for the work that you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of, you know, uh, limousine type one, and then I just need to get a driver to cruise me around, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm on the back of buses, so. Then... <laughs> oh, good. Very good. That's well, something I should aspire to. That's right. Now, uh, th- a couple of weeks ago, um, you were in the news uh, inadvertently uh, as it's been revealed that you have been spied on. Who have you been spied on by? Well, 
the name of the group's APT, um, Advanced Persistent Threat 31, but it's a, it's a state-sponsored or a Chinese government state-sponsored uh, group. Um, you may have heard of other ones, APT 40. Sorry, give me a second to clear my throat. Sorry, not getting emotional. Um, yeah. Just, being <laughs> just in case your listeners go, oh, he's lost his voice. Yeah, so it's a, a Chinese-backed, Chinese state-backed hacking group, Advanced Persistent Threat 31. They targeted uh, members of what's called IPAC, the Interparliamentary uh, Alliance on China. Mm. And there's three of us in New Zealand. There's Louisa Wall. You'll remember her as the Labour yes. MP. Yes. Uh, myself uh, and Professor Anne-Marie Brady, who deals a lot with China issues based out of Canterbury uh, University. So they targeted us, but important for your listeners to understand, they targeted members of IPAC um, across the globe. Right. So Australia, UK, Canada, you name it. So it's global spying by the, by the Chinese government, essentially. Yeah, it was a low-level attack. That doesn't take away from its seriousness. Yeah. Um, what they did was sent out emails, uh, which actually, Cam, had human rights themes to them. Right. And why I mentioned that is that's particularly attractive to people in, in IPAC. We're often speaking about human rights. So think of Uyghurs. Falun Gong, the Tibetans, House Christians, and others. Um, so it was, it was a, a lure, and in the email uh, was a picture, and inside that picture or image was one pixel, um, mm. and that pixel was able to, if loaded, uh, which it normally does when you open an email, yeah. uh, sent back information to the hackers about your IP address, what browser you're using, location, and so forth. So it's known as pixel reconnaissance. So it's, it's kind of a phishing email, wasn't it? They were hoodwinking you into thinking it was something you'd be interested in, so you'd open the email. You open the email, and then it's all over after that. Yeah, to a degree it, it was. It's one of those things, certainly as an MP at the time, you get so many emails from so many different people around the world. It's not unusual uh, to open an email. To be honest, this was back in 2021. I should have noted that. This was January 2021, so I honestly can't remember if I opened it or not, but really important too for listeners to understand there were no links, there were no macros. It wasn't as if uh, you know we blundered and opened a Microsoft document, just merely opening the email, loaded one little pixel, and off it went. So I actually still have uh, the email. Uh, well, well quarantined now, but I was able to search my old files and uh, found it. So uh, quite disturbing, and, and it, it's just not on. It, when a lot of people can talk about our trade understandably with China and our independent foreign policy and let's not annoy China, well, maybe the Chinese Communist Party could stop trying to infiltrate email accounts of members of parliament and academics. And, political, nice. and political parties. Oh, yeah. Look, this is, <laughs> this is ongoing, by the way. I mean, oh, we yeah. shouldn't be. They never yeah. stop. They never, they're like rust. They never, they never sleep. I remember when uh, my father was the president of, of the National Party and before that when he was the Auckland Regional Chair of the National Party, and he would regularly get phone calls from the Chinese consul in Auckland or or the ambassador to tell him to tell government ministers they needed to pull their head in over Taiwan or um, anything like that. And it was interesting to see that as a kid, the way that Dad responded to those things. He would say to them, well, thank you for your comment. But we live in a democracy and people are entitled to their point of view, even if you don't like it. Thank you, good day, and hang up. <laughs> I like your dad. <laughs> so, you know, and I remember too, uh, MPs would go to the National Day for Taiwan and they would wear their KMT pins and go to those sorts of functions. But that changed under John Key and it changed significantly where MPs as I understand it, were told not to go to the Taiwanese National Day, even though they might have been going for every year for 20 years, not to mention Taiwan, and to be completely uh, almost sycophantic to Chinese interests. And I thought to myself, is this the same party where my dad was the president and used to hang up on the Chinese ambassador and tell them to go fly a kite? You know, it's changed that much, and it was only in the space of about 10 or 15 years that it changed. Yeah, it doesn't take long in political parties for change to occur in a whole lot of different ways. I suppose, you know, different MPs have, have different views. I think it would be fair to say 
there's a number in the current National Party and certainly uh, in the years that I was in Parliament starting with the John Key government that it was much more pro-trade, pro-China. Um, I personally don't remember any instructions to, to not attend, but as someone who's a great supporter of uh, Taiwan would turn up to their, if you will, Independence Day celebrations, yep. would one of the only MPs actually, in fact, the only MP uh, who would turn up to the Tiananmen Square uh, memorials that they used to hold on Simon Street and other things. So he was still able mm. to go, but I, I do know it wasn't well welcomed by some colleagues who, I just call them the pro-trade, if I'm being diplomatic, the pro-trade guys, <laughs> which is very much, trade's important, which it is, do not talk about anything else. Don't, don't stir up on human rights. Don't talk about these you know, foreign espionage attempts. Just, just not talk about any of it. I obviously disagree. And like your father, I used to get phone calls from the embassy telling me off. And mainly, Cam, they'd be saying, you know, don't, don't comment on internal matters in China. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. They're welcome to have that opinion. But I would always end uh, reminding them that the irony that now, now telling a member of New Zealand's parliament what to do and say in his own country. Uh, so I hope they got the irony or the paradox or hypocrisy uh, in all of that. I don't think they do. I don't think they care. I mean, I've watched because I've got an interest in Fiji, of course, being born there, uh, watching the Chinese move in to Fiji and into Fijian society in ways that are alarming. You know, like you'd see some development opportunities happen, and, and again, it was all on the basis of trade. The Fijian government would say, this is fantastic. We've got Chinese investment. Um, we're going to build a new cement works to break, break the monopoly of the existing cement works. It sounds fine on the surface until you see how they actually do it. There's not a Fijian worker in sight. Then the building of, of the cement works, no Fijians were employed. They're all Chinese. Mm -hmm. The Chinese companies that come in to do the roading bring in uh, workers uh, from China to do it all. In the massive high-rise building that was being built in Suva that towers over Suva, it's built on a hill as well, so it makes it even look larger. It's a statement of Chinese power, mm. uh, even though it's it's purportedly a you know a private interest. But as you know, and I know, and anyone who's got half a brain knows, there are no private interests in China. Uh, there might be billionaires that own these companies, but they own those companies in conjunction and with the support of the CCP. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. And well, so you're seeing this um, soft power being exerted by China in places like Fiji, uh, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, and various other Pacific nations, because what the Chinese are doing is building infrastructure that's going to support them and their trade, and ultimately their military, should they ever need to um, to use those things. And what people just fail to understand, and New Zealand and Australia will never meet with aid, is that the Chinese can outspend us. They, look, they can. And <clears throat> when I was chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee, so this goes back a, a few years now, I actually initiated an inquiry uh, into foreign aid, or New Zealand's aid into the Pacific. And one of the big points of feedback, or actually two points from our Pacific neighbours, was one, they didn't want us telling them uh, what they wanted, you know, a whole bunch of uh, New Zealanders toddling up, or Australians for that matter, telling Fijians and Samoans and Tongans, hey, we think you need this. Their first feedback was, can we please tell you what we think we need, and, and then mm. help us? But the second really important part was they know that the likes of China can outspend us. But they actually see us more in a in a relationship. They actually respect the history that we have together. It just particularly whole... for, particularly for New Zealand, it's not mm. quite the same for Australia. The the particularly in Fiji, they they view Australians with some suspicion. That's true. There are different Pacific Islands have different relationships. But mm. certainly, then, if we wanted to narrow it to New Zealand, that in many ways, yep, they want us to come with aid. They're not worried if we don't spend as much. We we have a common history common values and sort of a, well, a fucker papa for want of a, a better term. And so mm. that they, they like that. Um, and so that's the space that we've got to play in rather than trying to compete with China. And I think the, the second thing, and look, you've well touched on it, actually, so I'm probably repeating what you've talked about. But yeah, China's game in the Pacific is not just simply trading rivalries. They want to change the rules of the game around how trade and other activities 
are undertaken. Uh, they do want to control or have greater control over fisheries and sea lanes. And yes, there is a military component. You know, they're pumping money into the Solomon Islands at the moment. There's a reason they're looking towards the Solomon Islands. Anyone who knows their history, and if you like myself, yeah. military history, the Solomons <laughs> is a key area. Now, we shouldn't you know, go nuts, and, but we should be aware of this and do what we can in our interests, our national security and sovereign interests, and that of the Pacific, uh, push back against it. Well, it's like Fiji as well. It's a key strategic location. That's where all of the Trans-Pacific cables uh, that provide our internet and phone services and those sorts of things, that's where they all come up in Fiji and then go back down again, obviously. But that is a station uh, for the transmission of important communications infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is why I thought New Zealand was a bit you know, short-sighted in allowing Huawei to supply communications equipment into our telecommunications network. Around the world, many other countries have banned the provision of that core infrastructure by Chinese technology companies. But no, not in New Zealand. We just let it happen. And the same things happened in in Fiji as well. So all of that core infrastructure, they, might, they don't actually need to control it in New Zealand. They can control it in Fiji. And that's what they are doing. Yeah, look, they're very, they, you've got to give them credit. It's very smart moves. And, you know, some people would say that, you know, it's just great power. Activities. This is what great powers do. The United Kingdom used to do it, the United States now. And there are some similarities, but at the end of the day, um, I prefer a world system that is primarily dominated by Western values and democracies uh, than a Chinese authoritarian regime. <laughs> so it's, it's a pretty basic choice. So it doesn't mean that everything that we do in New Zealand or in the West is, is good and right, but at the same time, uh, it's much more preferable uh, than to a dictatorship. Yeah, we, we don't have Tiananmen Squares happening in, it, in democracies by and large, mm. unless it's actually a revolution or some sort of overthrow of a, of a despotic regime. But by and large, people are peaceful, uh, are free to talk about things, uh, as particularly in, you know, in Reality Check Radio, we talk about all sorts of things that are forbidden in other, other media outlets to talk about, but we talk about them because we think it's important that we share those ideas with people. And the Chinese government is against all of that. They want to control the narrative. Uh, they want to control your technology, what's on your handset, who you're communicating with, who you're trading with, who you're paying money to. It's it's a hermetic environment completely controlled by the CCP. And I don't think we want that here. And I don't think we want that in the wider world either. 100%. I mean, look at Hong Kong. Um, it, it actually really breaks my heart because it's a wonderful uh, city, mm. a wonderful place. It's quite a vibrant democracy. Uh, it had a, an agreement when Britain handed it back uh, for 50 years of a, a relatively free system. Well, the CCP uh, screwed up that treaty uh, and seized control. And the vibrancy of Hong Kong has been removed. There are draconian national security laws now that would put many people in Hong Kong at risk simply talking to you or I. Uh, and I can say that because actually there's a trial going on in Hong Kong at the moment. Jimmy Lai, you, you talked about these million and million mm. and billionaires. He was a Hong Kong businessman, owner of the biggest newspaper, Apple Daily. China just flexed its muscles. They've arrested him, accused him of subversion because he stood for democracy. They've arrested a young guy, uh, Andy Lee, who had uh, very limited involvement with IPAC. Uh, and he's now in prison. They're both in front of the courts. Uh, because they dared to have an opinion. So it's a very chilling dynamic, and New Zealand shouldn't be naive that we would be any different if, again, the rules of the game were to to change. We just should not take our democracy for granted, nor give moral equivalence to authoritarian regimes. Yeah, and that, that, that's not just China. That's also places like Iran mm. and, and uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa. And, oh, and the majority of majority of the Middle East and Russia, of course. Yep, they're not democracies. They don't respect the rule of law. Um, and at, at a dictator's whim, businesses can be switched off. And that's what concerns me about telecommunications infrastructure. If you're going to conduct a trade war with somebody, what better way to uh, to impinge their ability to trade uh, than switching off their communications or uh, rerouting their communications? So you actually get the first view of what everything's going on. 
and yep. people underestimate the the vast powers of of the CCP and the Chinese government and the reach that they have. Look, a hundred percent, and I think it's one of the things that I've certainly tried to do in my work and my continued writings, certainly with the IPAC work, again, that interparliamentary alliance on China, is particularly to get New Zealanders to understand, because we're a wonderful country, Cam, but I think at times we can be a little bit naive. And uh, we go. I've just put off a pile of your listeners, but we're a bit naive, <laughs> um, that we're just this little country at the bottom of the earth. Um, everyone loves us. There would be no problems. Well, no, there are. Uh, and, you know, big autocratic countries like China, like Russia, in Iran, and Kiwis might be surprised to know just how many Iranian operations are conducted down here, foreign interference. Like they it's are, it's easy for them to do it yeah. because our our officials, um, our police, our intelligence uh, services aren't looking at them, uh, and uh, and if they are, there there's not enough of our intelligence services looking at what's going on, and and, and I see this all of the time. Um, with you know businesses where all of a sudden there's somebody who's from China comes in, uh, invests a bit of money in the business, sits inside the business, basically stealing intellectual property, uh, mm-hmm. which then goes back to China. Then next minute you're competing with someone who can make something eighty percent of what you're doing and not particularly well, but it's a lot cheaper, and so your business just walks out the door mm-hmm. because at some point people like to um, you know get a bargain. And it's terrible that that happens, but that is what is happening. Yeah, and that that you know buying selling is very much the human human nature. I mean, look, I've got a lot of respect for our intelligence services, but they are stretched. I mean, this is like so many things in New Zealand at the moment. It's a funding issue that there's not enough of them. There's not enough capability. I mean, something as simple as people who can uh, speak Mandarin or Cantonese and get security clearances. We don't have enough. So there's a lot of material that flies around in the likes of uh, WeChat and other fora uh, for people to, um, well, not so much intercept, but it would be useful for us to understand what's happening. But we just don't have the people and the capacity in this country yet. But this is the exciting, not to go off on a massive tangent, but this is the exciting element of AI and so forth. We're actually using these tools might, might be able to help us in the future. Now, just seeing as we're talking about China, there's been a bit of a, a, a kerfuffle with Winston Peters coming back from overseas and deciding to have a flick at Bob Carr, who had come here at the behest of the Labour Party. He was a bit of a rat bag as a, as a Premier of, of New South Wales, uh, was linked to a whole lot of corruption issues, but ultimately ended up working for the, the, uh, the federal government in a foreign affairs sort of arrangement. He came over here. Uh, at the behest of the Labour Party, to speak to a closeted group of Labour Party people, made some outrageous statements about AUKUS, about how, you know, uh, by cozying up to these nuclear powers, we were putting our our, our um, foreign policy at risk, et cetera, even though we're not even signing up to the pillar one of AUKUS, and uh, basically said we'd have rocks in our head. And, and, of course, Winston flicked back and said, well, you know, we can't really listen to anything that Bob Carr says. He's a shill for the for the uh, Chinese government. What are your thoughts on that? So, first and foremost, good at one level that Labour wanted to talk about AUKUS or power to them, although I was disappointed that it was really uh, very one-sided. Uh, not that I was at it, but when you've seen the reports and who was speaking, it was a very one-sided discussion, uh, which is very much anti-AUKUS. And look, there's reasons to be sceptical, worried about any AUKUS agreement. I'm laying my cards on the table. I'm in full support of New Zealand uh, signing up to Pillar 2. And as you've rightly pointed out, Cam, that's not the nuclear submarines. We don't want them. We don't need them. We couldn't afford them. Um, you know, We're proud of our anti-nuclear status. But Pillar 2 is around things like cyber security and other advanced technologies. And it behoves us not just as a country, uh, but as a, if a, a network of countries to be ready so it's a good, I think, a good thing, but I would have liked to see more debate. And it's unfortunate that this is becoming quite, I know this might sound stupid, but it is becoming quite political. And it seems almost just like a cheap reason for the opposition to oppose the government, which is a bit sad when we're dealing with national security. But well, then old, it, yeah, sorry. Yeah, what's interesting, though, is that these discussions with AUKUS or involving ourselves in Pillar 2 of AUKUS were started by Ardern and Hipkins. And now all of a sudden, they're again it. It seems, as you say, a cheap political stunt. Um, and then to to get, um, you know, what the Australian media or uh, 
people in politics uh, affectionately call Bob Carr to get Beijing Bob over here to rail against it because um, it might affect our trade with China. You know, maybe Winston's onto something here. I mean, I know there's a, a an Australian Financial Review um, article from a few years back that outlined precisely how Bob Carr gets his money, what what he does, and the the vault face he had from when he was the foreign minister to his positions now, particularly on China. And you have to wonder whether or not uh, actually he is in fact a shill for the Chinese government. Yeah, well, he, he's certainly been, so he became the head of the Australia-China Relations Institute, gosh, 10, 10 years ago. Yeah. As, if people want to look it up, yeah, as you mentioned, Cam, there's a, quite a good write-up in the Australian Financial Review, which quotes the likes of Clive Hamilton and others, really um, well-respected uh, sinologists or people who, who study China. So yeah, Bob, it seems to be one of these people where they're given these sinecures, these uh, well-paying titular roles, um, and he's been very supportive of of China. Now, like, again, it's a free world. He's 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 welcome to be, but we're also free to to draw attention to that. So yeah, he's been very positive about just about everything that China does and how Xi Ping and others are misunderstood. But he's also been quite critical of um, Australia. Now, again, he's welcome to be, but we're mm. welcome to call that out. So yeah, he's he has been known repeatedly to be more pro-China. The not now would I have said it the way Winston did? No, but that's Winston, and he he, he knows how to grab a headline. He knows how to hit hard. But I, I thought it was also interesting that Bob Carr struck back with the lawsuit. It, it's sort of a classic playbook there to try and silence uh, someone. I don't think it'll work for him, as Winston himself has said. He's he's been around the the track a few times. He he knows how to handle these things. But there's there's good reason to raise questions about Bob Carr. Yeah, well, Just as, the, there the, are questions the, about the New Zealanders too. Yeah, the Australian Financial Review headlines is how Bob Carr became China's pawn. <laughs> you know, so they're fairly. Uh, I don't recall Bob Carr suing the Australian Financial Review, and there's certainly if you Google Bob Carr sue sues Australian Financial Review, and there's no evidence of anything ever happening. So. It, it bemuses me that he thinks that he can silence uh, Winston Peters, but with the mere threat of a lawsuit. Again, it's a it's a classic ploy. I mean, personally, again, I, I'm prejudiced for want of a better word. I mean, I have a particular view as is coming through about our relationship with China. But you know, there's Paul Keating in Australia too. It was interesting when the Foreign Minister of China came over a few months ago that they had a private meeting uh, with uh, Paul Keating. Now, again, Paul's welcome to have his. Views are similar to De Bob's. Again, we have similar people here in New Zealand. You know, John Key two New Years ago wrote a very long puff piece, I would say, in support of China and what it's doing. Again, they're all welcome to their view, but we're welcome to, if you will, expose that and speak to it. Yeah, and, and question why they've got these views and why they never said them when they were in in Parliament or mm. or whenever. So, you know, you're right. It's, we live in a free country. Well, still free. Still free. Uh, where we can actually say these things. It's just interesting to see Bob Carr lawyer up and, and try and threaten Winston Peters. It's, he'd, like, he'd like nothing better than for there to be a defamation lawsuit from between now and the election. It would be oh, he, would. Just, he would just love it. And, and I'm pretty sure his lawyers will be salivating at, at discovery and, and looking at bank statements and things like that over – over a period of years could be quite interesting. Again, I just think it's a, an intimidatory type tactic to lawyer up and threaten uh, lawsuits. To it's it's not that in itself is a sign. And then you have to ask who's who's funding this or prepared to fund it. I wonder if they'll pull back at the last. Um, I mean, it's pretty hard to get defamation in this country. I'm no lawyer, but my general understanding is defaming someone or rather getting a or defaming a politicians. A Defaming politicians or people involved in politics and, and in partisan politics as well, Winston will be saying, well, this is the rough and tumble of political debate. You came over here, you uh, interfered in New Zealand's foreign policy by making some outrageous statements, and I gave you, as the foreign minister, I gave you a flick back. That's about the extent of, of what it is. It's a little bit of a, a petty fight, um, which is kind of meaningless, with a little few insults and barbs thrown in as well, but... Uh, yeah, it's always highly entertaining, but um, I'm actually glad to see Winston back because we've got some entertainment back in our news. 
yeah, well, we need characters in, in Parliament, and he's certainly one of them. And I'm actually really pleased he's the foreign minister. I actually like a lot of what Winston uh, does and his approaches to things. And, and look, he's well respected by a lot of our allies. So regardless of people's political views or views of him, he actually is a really good foreign minister for us. Yeah, now, just speaking of characters in Parliament, let's let's just segue into the Green Party, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? Well, you know, have they got a systemic problem inside the Green Party? You you have a look at the terrible issues that they've had, and you know the, the key ones are, of course, uh, Golrez Garaman and her uh, stealing her five finger discounts around the boutiques of Auckland uh, and Wellington. Then you've got uh, James Shaw quitting, and if you read between the lines, he's quitting in frustration. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you've got Julianne Genta, who not only was overbearing and rude in the in the Parliament, uh, but appears to have been overbearing, rude, and possibly in one case assaulted somebody, pushing her point of view. Is there something wrong inside the Green Party? I think yes is the the short answer. Um, if I might, you've missed two others. There's Dana, and I'm sorry I forgot her last name, but she's uh, still D- current- Darlene Tana. Darlene Tanner, apologies. Yes, um, migrant that, you know, exploitation. Yeah, exactly. Still um, on the MP's salary, but nowhere to be seen. And then, of course, Elizabeth Kedikedi, who had to leave last mm. parliament because of her comments around Chloe Swarbrick. So do they have a problem? Most definitely. And I, I think we can say that. It was Someone else pointed it to me the other day because I, I was saying no political party is innocent. You know, every political party's had its its problems and scandals, and I've certainly seen a number of my national MPs go for some pretty uh, disgusting activity, behaviour, and so forth. So no party's innocent. But as it was pointed out to me, this is four, and if you include James, five Green MPs, a party that is so small, yet so many of its MPs are getting into to trouble. And so, yeah, they do have a, a cultural problem. Exactly what it is that's driving, I don't fully understand, although you could sort of speculate it's sort of a holier-than-thou attitude, and it's still there. Yeah, they're so and, smug and sanctimonious, aren't they? They're always telling everybody how that, how we should live our lives, and then when they're revealed as being shabby little charlatans uh, for whatever reason, they get all indignant and say, oh, well, you know, um, uh, we were passionate about the uh, about the discussion, which is which is the line that's being trotted out about Julianne Genter. Um, we had oh no, um, poor Golrez Garman has suffered for being a refugee and a woman and a person of colour. Um, these are all just pathetic excuses uh, for poor behaviour. And if we look back at at poor behaviour of say national MPs, and a classic example in relation to the Julianne Genter situation is Tim Vandermolen. He was censured by the Privileges Committee unanimously. Mm. I doubt that we'll see a unanimous sanction of Julianne Genter at the Privileges Committee now that Jerry Brownlee sent it to the committee. Yeah, I, I hope they do, but I'm I'm unsure they will either. I mean, it's a very good contrast, you know, um, of behaviours. Tim was grilled day after day after day. Um, I mean, I mean, to carry my hand, I'm a friend of Tim's. It, it was a hard. Mm a hard time, but almost unrelenting coverage and focus, and he remained in the parliament, actually, whereas, yeah, with Julianne, to be fair, I think some of the media, dear old Mikey Sherman last night was actually beginning to put a little bit of heat on Julianne, Um, but, you know, here's an MP who's accused of multiple activities, including, you know, grabbing someone, uh, and has now absconded off to the Chatham Islands, uh, to be clear to your viewers, or listeners, sorry, she's... The MP for there. NP for there, but it's an interesting coincidence. But yeah, there's too many excuses. And I think maybe that's what drives part of this cultural problem, Cam, is that they've always got an excuse for their behavior. Um, And actually, a lot of it's just not excusable or, you know, we're all under stress. We all have long, tiring weeks. Um, I don't tend to start yelling and screaming at people. And, you know, like you, I'm passionate about different topics, Mm. uh, but I've never lost my rag on them (laughs) or gone challenging an MP across the house. If you're raising your voice and and remonstrating up close and personal, you've kind of lost the argument, in my view. Mm-hmm. And the video of it was very unbecoming. It's a little bit distant. It's hard to see. But um, she clearly is standing over the top of him, uh, very close, whilst there is a debate going on about a particular bill. 
Mm. Uh, you know, the minister is sitting at the head of the table, uh, Simeon Brown, with one of the deputy speakers in the chair beside him. That, that, this is a committee stage that we're talking about here. Mm. Uh, and she's seen fit to rise from her own seat at the other end of the chamber, trot down there or storm down there, brandishing a rather thick uh, bunch of papers and remonstrate with another minister because of something he had equipped or, or said you know, in response to some of the debate speeches that was going on. It's quite bizarre behaviour. It is, but I've seen it before uh, mm. from her. Again, she, she does feel things passionately. And at one level, that's great. I think actually people being passionate, but actually it has to be done constructively. Uh, and so what she did was completely, totally inappropriate. And for those who have seen the video, you can see initially the shock actually on MPs' faces of across both sides of the house going, whoa, because there are constructive ways to do this. I mean, you, you, you give your speeches in Parliament from your seat. Yep. Um, you don't walk around. You don't go up to the face of another MP. But if I had wanted to, say, talk to Matt Ducey or she wanted to talk to him about something, she can send a note or actually you more, how would you put it, politely walk across and say, hey, look, have you got a moment uh, to step into the lobby to have a chat? Or as I used to do with you know, when Labour ministers, you go over to them, but again, not threatening. You go, oh, hi, um, Andrew or any – well, thinking of Andrew Little because of the foreign affairs and defence stuff. So mm. can I just have a quick word? And you would. But what yeah. she did, completely, completely out of line. And, you know, just do the thought experiment, Cam. If this was in reverse, yeah, had a national MP gone charging over, they wouldn't have lasted four hours before they were accused of uh, toxicity and abuse and bullying and violence. That'd be – your career would be toast. Toast. Totally. But again, I wonder if if this behaviour uh, of Julianne Genta and and you can look at, at Chloe Swarbrook herself, um, you know, with her draping tea towels around her shoulder and, and shouting horrendous slogans that basically intimate uh, she's in favour of genocide of Jews in, in the Holy Land. There's a you know, this activist element that's within the Green Party and, and it's got stronger and stronger and you haven't got, you know, fine people like Jeanette Fitzsimons there who was a totally reasonable person, passionate but totally reasonable and, you know, inoffensive in, in every way. That was the old Green Party. We've now got this activist base where any tactic goes and the sanctimoniousness of them that they're right and everyone else is wrong and therefore you must listen to this opinion mm -hmm. leads them to have this arrogant, overbearing uh, demeanour, not just in Parliament, but also um, in their private life as well when they're shopping or doing whatever. Yeah, it's sort of a, an entitlement that comes out of a zealotry. I mean, it's... <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to put it succinctly. I mean, you've actually put it exceptionally well yourself, but they they, they seem very blind to their own behaviours while being so obsessed with uh, everybody else's. And, you know, the way that the Greens are conducting themselves uh, in these protests, the words they're choosing is quite ironic because the words they use uh, are seen by many people, Jewish or otherwise, as being calls for violence. Mm. Uh, and yet, you know, the Greens are the first to say that if I use misused someone's pronouns, then I'm a terribly violent, angry person. And you go, well, hold on a moment, hold on. Um, you know, look well, at Marabo Davidson saying that all, um, crimes are mostly committed by cis white males. Oh, I know. You know, I mean, and and then every time you see uh, someone who's not that in Parliament, it's all over Twitter saying, oh, just another cis white male committing. Oh, wait, you yeah. know, um, that's the sort of blanket statements that they make about almost anything. And, you know, the Darlene Tana one, that was supposed to have been completed within two weeks. We, here we are, what, six weeks later, complete and utter silence. Uh, you've got a, a Green Party MP uh, who I, I nicknamed him El Woco Loco, um, uh, but, you know, Ricardo uh, Menendez March, He's always railing against exploitation of migrant workers, and there he is sitting right next to one who's actually been doing it. I think when you become so obsessed in this activist space with everybody else, you lose a view of yourself. And I think that's why you end up with that blindness or entitlement, as you say. Here's a party which, you know, rightly calls out migrant exploitation, yet one of their members uh, allegedly has been part of that. A party that says we don't like bullying or violence. Uh, but, you know, rallied people to a violent protest 
in Albert Park, a party that says they stand for women, and yet that same protest in Albert Park was targeted on beating up a woman. I mean, it's just mm. the absurdities drive us mad. And I think the best we can do is just continue to draw attention to it. Uh, but, you know, jumping back to the review and to, to Darlene, I mean, I'd almost forgotten. I mean, but that's the whole point of the delay, isn't it? That that most most of us, and here's me, a former MP, forgot all about it until yeah. the Genta event. It was like, oh, my God, there's another one as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually do believe there is a, a systemic problem inside the Green Party uh, with candidate selection, with behaviour. When you've got basically a bunch of rowdy, shouty-type people who think they're 100% right on any issue that they they care to voice an opinion on, it's going to grate against everybody else. But they seem, I always say you know, facetiously that, that it's okay, they're the Green Party, they've got the uh, shield of sanctimony to hide behind. <laughs> well, you, you do see that. I mean, we, we've touched on it briefly, but you do see that in the responses. There's always lots of excuses put forward. But I would suggest just about any of them put forward, A, don't make sense of themselves, and B, apply to any MP, in fact, to any New Zealander. You know, oh, we're feeling grief-stricken. Oh, we're really under pressure. Well, that's most families. But most families, most individuals in those families are not running about. Look, we're um, all stressed, right? But I don't go um, to the nearest menswear shop and and uh, give myself a five-finger discount for a, for a pretty cool jacket or, 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 or anything. No one does that, right? Yeah. And here's the other thing. You don't do it just once. You do it again and again and again. I mean, she's charged with three um, stores uh, taking stuff. You may be assured that there will be others. Oh, it's the old where there's smoke, there's fire. And I, I suspect, I think we're up to now three people now have come out around Julianne Genta. Mm. Um, there's there's more to, to come. I mean, look, we'll see where the privileges complaint goes. Uh, we'll see what Julianne has to say when she returns from the Chathams. I thought, you know, to be fair, I thought she spoke only briefly last night to TV One News, but it actually it was not bad. Yeah. Uh, but there's still a lot more that needs to be. As she climbed onto a, on, into a C-130 Hercules. That's right. <laughs> I would have thought she would have cycled there. I mean, she asked us to cycle to absurd places in our lives, so maybe we should have asked for her to cycle to the Chathams. I mean, it's absurd, of course, but... But, you know, that's the hypocrisy of these people. Well, I'm actually fascinated why, and someone should probably be asking questions more out of curiosity, why it was a C-130. Because obviously there's commercial flights mm. uh, there, but you know, obviously a military plane's going. There's probably, there'll be a good reason, I suspect, but it'll be interesting to know why and who else was going. But that's a, that's a segue, if you will, or a separate issue to how she's behaved. But there's serious issues in the Green Party that have to be addressed. Well, maybe she's visiting her, her um, voters, uh, all five of them, I note. There was only five in the Chatham Islands that voted for Julianne Gidd at the last really? election. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be able, they've probably still got a phone box they can have a meeting in. I, I must admit, I, I have sadly never made it to Great Barrier or the Chathams. There's two, those are both places that Rachel and I want to visit. We've, have you been there yourself? So I'm switching into the interviewer all of a sudden. <laughs> no, no I, I haven't been to either of those. Uh, I, I th These days, the only island I spend a bit of time on is Waikiki, but uh, there's a, a very pleasing distraction there at the moment. So. <laughs> Good. I think we better leave that there. <laughs> I think we better. And you've got to go to, to another call. So thanks for your time, Simon, and um, welcome back to The Crunch. And no doubt we'll we'll talk again throughout the year. Will do. Hey, Cam, great to have you back on here and the rest of the team. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Simon is such a fascinating fellow to talk to. I really enjoy our discussions. But it's appalling that the Chinese government thinks that it's okay to spy on our MPs. He's not an MP now, but it's still pretty dire news to find out that the Chinese seem to think it's okay to spy on us. What do you reckon? Let me know your thoughts by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater, right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.
Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we're going to find out what they think about the upcoming budget, which includes $153 million for up to 50 charter schools to help lift declining educational performance. And this was announced on Tuesday by Associate Education Minister David Seymour. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. How are you this week? G'day, Cameron. I'm very well. Now, what's your topic this week, Matt? There's a lot been happening. Well, on Tuesday, David Seymour announced that in the budget, there is going to be $153 million allocated for up to 50 charter schools. And he says it's going to help lift declining educational performances. I'm interested in your thoughts on this because you've got kids at school. I do. My kids go to private school because I hate the public school system. So I think charter schools are fantastic. I also don't like unions. I don't like aiming, having the lowest common denominator across all the board. I like individual success, and I think that teachers should be paid individually. But anyway, so charter schools are great because if people want to start a school and they've got a, you know, they could be a neglected group or whatever, then they can get funding in teachers as long as they're hitting the recognised standards. I think it's fantastic. So you honestly think it's the best policy. Yeah, it's one of the best policies. I mean, I think last week we were talking about general stuff and Paul was saying that um, the best thing to uh, to help your kids with their education is for them to actually go to school in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So if you've got a small charter school in the far north that's keeping an eye on their kids and making them turn up, it's far better than a big generalised poor-performing public school. I, I, it's just a no-brainer, especially for poor-performing parts of our society, to have a customised school to make them learn better. You know, they might come from harder backgrounds. And I, I think that was the real shame of shutting down charter schools last time, is that the Labour government directly shut down public sco- uh, charter schools Sorry, to and it hurt the poorer parts of our society, and they did it just for ideological reasons. I thought that was actually terrible that, that Chris Hipkins did that. Well, they did it. They did it to pacify the teacher unions who were opposed to charter schools. And I, I've never been able to grasp the concept as to why they were opposed to it. The last time we had charter schools, I think they were saying oh, it's terrible that we could end up with some teachers at the schools that aren't properly qualified. And yet every week almost there's a story about some teacher who's interfered with some children or, or committed some acts of violence or right. done something. And these are all registered teachers, you know, the same argument they, that the control freaks put up for having a gun register. Oh, if we have a gun register, we'll know where all the guns are. Well, we have a teacher's register, but it doesn't stop ratbag teachers defrauding people, fiddling with kids and committing all manner of other crimes. So why would it uh, make a difference no. for that? No, but char- charter schools have got some really strict KPIs they have to hit. And mm. so it doesn't really matter if the teacher's not qualified. If you've got a builder or, you know, someone who's been working for 50 years, do you want a, do you want a teacher or a builder to teach woodworking? You know, like, do you want the experience or do you just want the qualification? I, I would take the experience every day, you know. Yeah, there's that so, old saying, isn't it, that those who can do and those who can't teach. Oh, you've got all the sayings, mate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let's well, piss, piss everyone off your sayings. Like that. Yeah, it's true. Well, so charter was, schools go out and get the experience, and then teach it directly to kids, and and give these kids inspiration and direct education. And what's wrong with that? Well, they just hate it because it's not part of the union. Why is Labour so attached to the unions? Well, they I, mean, I get it from like the 1930s and the coal mining, but what today? We moved on, haven't we? We moved on. I mean, no one likes a bad boss. And, you know, maybe there is a place in society for unions, but, but there shouldn't be, you know, uh, like the government uh, did, the last government didn't say that we're basically bringing back compulsory unionism via stealth. The best thing that ever happened in 1990 was when Jim Bolger um, brought in the Employment Contracts Act, and that was the end of the unions and the control. I remember that we had all these things like um, you know, the Mangaree Bridge that was 20 years in the building because the scaffolders would be on strike or the fitters and turners would be on strike or the welders would be on strike. It was just never-ending. 
yeah, over pathetic things like the temperature of the hot water and all this and that. I, but why doesn't Labor move on from unions? Well, why do they? I mean, move, it, it still, why, do, why do they? Why don't they move on from everything? I mean, they, they they're backing the detritus of society most of the time. They're, they're not in it for everybody else. They're only in it for themselves, and um, and some vocal little groups um, that that they uh, seem to entertain all the time. Well, as far as I can work out, they're in it to protect the crumbs. You know, they spoke out about the extra jail beds. Yeah, they protect all the useless teachers. I just, I think the Labour Party's lost. And, and they and, want, and, and they want men to have access to women's bathrooms. I mean, I don't think that's a winning election strategy, do you? Uh, well, if you're trying to win Central Wellington, it might be. But other than that, <laughs> I don't think you're going to win a seat in the South Island. No, 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 or, or rural Waikato, or somewhere like that. You know. Why can't Labor defend charter schools and send them to the poorer parts of our community and fund them properly and get? Because we know through from police records that all most of the bad kids come from the same families. Like they they know all the ramrading kids. You know, it's all the same families. You know, why can't we target them with education? You know, it'd be money well spent. That's what they rent it out, stopping it at the front end. You know, rather than locking them up. No, well, well, charter think, schools do that, and yet yeah, I think though the Labor Party has an attitude that. Uh, success is measured by how much you spend on something, uh, not on <laughs> not not on how effective that spending is, not on the outcome. So you you look at the um, you know that uh, the announcement of the bike bridge, for example, right? They, they spent you know twenty or thirty million dollars or something like that on fifty, yeah. fifth, maybe fifty million on feasibility studies, which ended up being well, this is. Hopeless, we can't build it. But they announced it like it was the best thing ever. Yeah, but at that point in time, Arden was flailing in the polls, mate, and she was trying to buy everyone's votes. And it was it was just more... Uh, anyway, we're, we're covering ground that we're all bitter about. But <laughs> this week's been good. I mean, the Charter Schools announcement was amazing. And also Arden's Christchurch call got defunded by government. So it got, we've got had a good week. She gassed the. Uh, they gassed the uh, Christchurch call. The I think funding, Winston, public yeah, I think, I think Winston might have had a hand in that. that. Yeah, I think that would have been a little, a little bit of Winston's utu in there. I think. Well, Winston's got quite a bit of utu dishing out. <laughs> you've had you've had big bang for your buck, mate. I'll give you that for your vote buck. Yeah? Oh, I think so. Would you say that you, this is the most voting buck you've had for in your voting career? Like, well, what's national ever delivered? You know. What what have they ever delivered? No. Nothing. They're the they're the party of the status quo. The, the, all they all they like to do is manage the decline, uh, but it's a decline nonetheless. But they think that they can manage it better than Labor. So yeah, yeah they I take think Labor you're right. Tidy it up. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. I've had a bigger bang for my buck with New Zealand First than I've ever had. And you know, every time I see Winston in the house or or speak to Shane Jones, I think, yeah, I got this one right. Winston's getting younger. I saw him in their house the other day asking Chris Hipkins what a woman is. And I just thought, oh, my God, he's getting more power. What's Jan feeding him, Cam? Oh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. He's um happiest I've ever seen him in a long time, you know. He's up in the Pacific again yeah. do, doing another visit. He's done more visits in six months than the previous foreign minister did in six years. Well, the previous foreign minister was scared of airplanes, <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> she thought she could zoom anyway, her way. That's enough from me this week, Cam. <laughs> she could, thought she could zoom her way into in, into the foreign ministry. <laughs> it's madness. All anyway, right, Jimmy. Well, that, we'll talk that, again that, next week. Thanks for your call. Thanks, Cam. See ya. Welcome to Cam's buddies, Lindley. Good to have you back. Hello. Hey, Lindley. Good to have you back. Oh, hi, Cam. How are you? I'm fantastic. I got a bit of a. Well, that's a, good to a, hear. A, uh, there's a there's a few um, a few ideas have come in on the email for your testing ideas, so uh, that'll be good for, <laughs> good for you to 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 look up. But anyway, this week I want to talk about uh, charter schools. Mm. Now, on Tuesday, David Seymour announced that in the budget there's going to be 153 million dollars for up to. Char, uh, 50 charter schools 
and he says it's going to help lift declining educational performance. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, well, I loved school, you know. We had a country school, and mm. we had all kids in one class, so that's probably quite unusual today. But we were exposed to several levels at once, um, so if you were a little bit bright, you could actually advance your state of education quite well and not only that we were under the teacher's eye the whole time Um, things were very different and probably still are at country schools but um, this is an absolute horror story um, what has happened with the education today so I would back David Seymour for trying to do something Um, he's trying to address Truancy, which is one of the factors. Yep. He's trying to do something about getting some of these kids so that the teachers are actually watching them and noticing if they actually fall behind a bit, and I think that's absolutely huge at school. But this is how I see it, really. it's If you go over the history, it's 17 years since the... National Standards Policy came in. Yep. And it's absolutely unbelievable if you actually read the history of that 17 years. It's 17 years of arguing over government created task forces, institutions, support groups, programs, and the like. Some with impressive names, and get your um, head around this one. The Curriculum Progress and Achievement Ministerial Advisory Group 2019. And then another one which is quite current, the Curriculum and Assessment Forward Planner. Now, how do you plan backwards? Don't you just plan forward anyway? Just saying. (laughs) Now, exactly. 70, what? I was just saying exactly. I'm I'm cracking up with laughter because it's it's well, true. How, how do everyone you can't plan backwards? Can you? <laughs> no, everyone says this nowadays. You know, going forward, what's your plan going forward? Well, you wouldn't actually expect an education uh, government outfit to come out come up with that, would you? I mean. <laughs> Yeah. They're advising education, but they're coming out with a statement like that. That's the name of that group. Yeah, but they probably now, had a committee. They probably had a committee um, of ten or twelve people oh, that met weekly for six months to come up with the title. Six months would have been an absolute track record. If yeah. you go over that seventeen years, it's taken years and years just to get through a committee. And you get some recommendations. It's absolutely unbelievable. Done? And where are our net, where, done where are our standards now? They've slipped, haven't they? They got got worse. Well, I know what they are because we talked a little bit about this on a previous talk. Yeah. Um, we've got now not, uh, Chris Hipkins. Just recently, he pledged, and I like this, this is a little bit like mathematical poetry, and I think that's why I came up with it. In 2022, he pledged 22 million. That's quite rhythmic, isn't it? 2022, 22 million um, towards education. Well, what has it achieved? You know, you've raised the question. It's achieved... 98% 98% of decile 1 year 10 students failed a basic writing test. Now, is that 13 to 14 year olds? Year 10? I don't know. I've I think lost it track. is. Yeah, probably. Yes. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, anybody would lose track on this stuff. Um, 66% of students failed literacy and numeracy for NCEA. Eighty percent of Maori students were below curriculum by intermediate level. Now that's what seventeen years of committees and groups and task forces and refreshes and forward plans and billions and billions and billions of dollars has produced. Mm. It's, it's um, shocking. It's really, really shocking. 
Um, but if you ask the teacher I unions, said, if, if you ask the teacher unions, how are we going with our schooling? They'll tell us that we're world leaders, that we're brilliant, we're the best at this, and we're the best at that, and, and it's it's all lies. Well, probably they need to go back to school, don't they? Well, they've never left school. That's the problem. No, I mean they don't know their maths. They can't. They can't add up because that is absolutely untrue. You think about it, right? It's a, 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 a person who's a school teacher is someone who went through the school system, and they left school and went to university or to teachers' college, and then they went back to school. They've never lived in the in the real world. They've only ever lived in a school of one form or another. Mm, um, I've been very fortunate to, in my lifetime, to come across really outstanding teachers. Um, but that I was a long time ago, Ken. I couldn't, I couldn't name one. Of all the teachers oh, really? that I ha- had, I could not name one. And I, in, in particular, oh. in, the, in the fifth form, I had a, a teacher... His name was Rory Barrett, and his claim to fame is that he is a leading mathematics teacher and a brilliant teacher with all these accolades and, and all of these awards. Well, let me tell you what fifth form maths was like for my class. We'd never saw the teacher. We'd have a, a, a prefect come into the class and tell us what pages of the textbook we were to do and what, uh, and what quiz in the textbook we were to do and what our homework was. And we and then at the end of the class, we had to hand in the homework from the day before that had been handed out. But we never saw that teacher, this award-winning mathematic teacher. And the one or two times he did turn up, he told us about how great wrestling was and weightlifting. Yes. Well, you're never going to learn that way um, because that's not the way the brain works, especially with kids. You'd just be, you'd have lost interest uh, immediately. But um, I've always had a standard um, with teachers. If you have to do homework, they're not worth their salt because if they teach uh, their work up on the blackboard, which is what they had, if you, you watch them writing on the blackboard, you soak half of it in just watching that. Um, and you can do what they require for homework in the class if they're any good. Um, and I can identify with that because if you have to read boring pages in a textbook, a lot of, a lot of them can't even read, you know, mm. um, and then go home and, and into God knows what sort of home um, and do homework and come back again the next day for the same boring uh, session, well, no, you're not going to learn. That, that that's not how you teach people, and we spoke about that hot house people program on another mm. phone call, didn't we? Yeah. Um, that that guy got those kids jumping out of their seats to answer questions, and well, those and those, them- those teachers are few and far between. I mean, I'll give you another example. My seventh form English teacher, a guy called called Graham Marshall, went on to become the principal of Hutt Valley High School. In the first term, I set the exam and I got 95% for English. But he scaled Mm. me down to 75% because the guy who came second in the class, who got 77%, handed in all his homework and I never did. And so Graham Marshall scaled my marks down to below the guy who was the girly swat and handed in all his homework so that that guy could beat me. And then he wrote on my report... a splendid exam result achieved with little obvious effort. You know, all he ever did, this was the guy who was the head of the PPTA in Auckland at the time, This all that guy ever did was belittle his students. And he went on to be mm. a principal at a school, and he, and he carried on, and he's fated as a brilliant teacher and principal. And my experience yeah, of well, him was not. that he was narcissistic, and uh, and highly political and snarky and snaky the whole time. Yes, and and this scaling up and down, they do it in uh, well. Do they have school cert now? I don't think they do. But um, in the days of school cert, they used to scale them up or down de- yeah. depending on what quota they wanted to pass. And and you know this is another topic, isn't it? Altogether, yep, absolutely absurd. Um, yeah, I mean, I can identify with you because 
education is just so important, and you are at the mercy of your teachers, unfortunately. Yeah, and if the um, teachers no, are dolts, you know, you know, if they're absolute dolts, stupid beyond belief, and and many teachers are, then then they're actually a pox on the system because they're affecting the livelihoods and the futures of so many kids until finally they get railroaded out of the out of the profession. But but very often they don't. They carry on and have a thirty year career. And you think about that at thirty years, they might have ten classes of thirty kids a. Year. Year, so it's 300 kids a year that they're affecting negatively. Oh, it's just absolutely appalling. I know it's just huge and it has a compounding effect, you know, because those kids grow up and they have kids, and you know, then you've got a chain of kids or generations that have been affected, you know, it doesn't just affect that, that kid. It, it's absolutely appalling. I've, I've never seen anything like it, but. Um, there are other factors too. Um, I can sympathise with some teachers, but there's also this other issue of the number of teachers that are mandated out of work, and I know quite a few of them. I'm absolutely shocked how many mm. there are, and apparently they've got a mark on their file, a, a black line written across the uh, file, so that if they reapply... They're identified those are the, te- as a, those um, are the teachers I want to um, see in schools. Those are the teachers that I want to see rewarded because they're free thinkers. They're not doing what the union yeah, well, says they're or they're doing what the bosses says. They're, they're the people who should be teaching in schools, not the, the forelock tuggers that are already there. Well, I know. Uh, that's absolutely correct. It's the same with all the doctors and free thinkers there too. They're, they're out on their ear. But um, many of these teachers, you know, they'll never return. They've learned another way to earn a living. Yeah, they've probably and got they'll never private, go back. So. They've probably got private students um, and doing things over Zoom or uh, running a little boutique, um, you know, homeschooling type arrangement. You know, there's all sorts of things that if people are creative. That's what they'll do. Oh, I know. I, I know four of them that are in uh, a business here in Christchurch. One of them, some people know who I'm talking about, one of them, he was a senior dean at Papua Nui High School, a revered history teacher, a really, really lovely guy, and he was mandated out. Um, well, he and three other teachers have set up a business. They'll never go back. They are lost, and they, like you say, they're free thinkers. They can think for themselves, and they're outstanding people. They've been lost to the, you know, to the education Yeah. Um, industry, if you could call it that. But um, there are a few other questions um, which need to be raised apart from just um, starting up charter schools, and that's how the social conditions have changed, you know, over time. Mm. Um, How many kids are still taught to read at home before they go to school? Um, What about this number of autistic-related conditions? Why do they seem to be on the increase? That's another question. Yeah, very much so. What's happening there? Because they're a hell of a strain on um, mothers and fathers, um, you know, across the board. And we've got the teachers, as I said, that were mandated out of work, and a lot of them will never go back. Um, we've got the overall breakdown of the family unit, which is a huge effect on kids. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just having a, one solo parent struggling to raise them and that. Um, and then we've got truancy. Uh, so, you know, Seymour's trying to do something about that, which and creates some accountability. I think that's fantastic too, but will it work? Um, well, you've got, you to start some, raised, you've got to start somewhere, though, Lindley, and, and what gets measured gets done. In business, if you measure something, it gets done. And, you know, well, that, had, they haven't been recording truancy um, stats. They've just let it all slide. And so the first step is, well, we're going to record it, and then, we, then we'll know what's happening. Then we can address it. Oh, I, I think it's a really good start, you know, yeah. I really do. But it's the same with the education, uh, Cam. You know, they they haven't been being assessed often either, you know, because it's not, not nice to do a school report and all this sort of rubbish. Um, yeah. So it's very hard to assess how, how well children are doing as well. 
Well, if you go back you know, to my school, accountability is, is out. Yeah, if you go back to my school, out, out the door. Yeah, that's right. If you go back to my school reports, I had snarky comments by the teachers, right? And 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 fair enough. And in, in some regards, I didn't do work during the class, but I didn't need to as I was smart. Um, but these days, the reports um, don't tell you that your kid's a dopey um, student or. Uh, doesn't attend class or anything. They come up with all sorts of nice things to say about the drop kicks that are in the classroom at, at the moment, and so they don't actually learn uh, that that the prop that they might actually be part of the problem themselves because the teachers aren't allowed to do that. So it might you know, hurt Sebastian's um, feelings or, or little Charlotte's feelings. She might get hurt and 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 you know oh, be upset know. and have to have a mental yeah. health day for, because she got a bad report. Yeah, well, it's all part of that victim philosophy, isn't it? Um, I mean, if you go through that 17 years um, that anyone can can look at, um, the number of times they raised uh, Maori children being victims and all that, and yes, I can understand that uh, that needs to be addressed, but to constantly bang on about it um, and make them believe they are victims, that's actually counterproductive. Well, well, you see that now as as young adults, you know they've had gone through a school system that's told them they're vulnerable, that they're drop kicks, um, that mm. they need extra help, mm. that they're special, um, that they need um, a, a teacher aid, um, that you know that nothing they do is wrong, uh, and then they go out into the real world and it smacks them in the face, and you know we wonder why there's a, a huge incidence of depression. In New Zealand, because reality comes creeping up on you rather fast when you're outside of the cotton wool of the of the education system. Oh, well, it sure does. It sure does, and you've got no experience of it whatsoever. Um, it's a rude shock, even if you're well adapted. Oh, totally. Well, I thought it was anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that's what makes you your, your ability to deal with challenges. You know, if you got a school report that said. Lindley needs to try harder or concentrate more in class rather than chatting, um, then your parents would sit there and say, well, come on, Lindley, you, you know, you need to lift your game here. We're not uh, sending you to school to eat your lunch. Um, and uh, and then you, you would be shamed almost into lifting your game because you didn't like the disappointment of your parents. Well, of course, that word shame, um, you've hit the nail on the head there because when you and I were raised, we were actually controlled by shame and then it became seen as as a terrible thing um, that sort of stifled children. But that that was certainly how I was controlled. And so, you know, you were fearful. I mean, if you had a terrible school report, you're actually fearful to, to give it to you parents because they in turn would feel shame. They wanted you to do really well. Uh, it was a great motivator, shame. Well, you uh, know, I remember my no father saying, I remember my father saying to me, if you get the cane at school, when you get home, you'll get it again. So I made sure I did. Oh, yes, I did, heard I made sure I made sure of two things. Either I didn't get the cane or I didn't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is right. <laughs> this anyway, is right on because that note, hiding stoop. That's right. Hiding's. Hiding's do, do teach kids. They, they teach kids to be liars. Hiding's. I no, never stole well, the cookies. No. No, but hiding's also stop bullying. But anyway, you're not allowed to do that these days. <laughs> Lindley, I've got another call oh, no. coming through, so I better take that. Uh, lovely talking okay, to you again. Cam. Thanks. Okay. See you later. Bye bye. Right. Welcome to Cam's buddies, Paul. Good to have you back. How are you, Cam? I'm fantastic, as I'm always. But you know the rules on that. It doesn't matter how crap I'm feeling. The answers are always fantastic. All good. All good. Yeah. Hey, um, you might have seen on Tuesday uh, David Seymour uh, made an announcement. The upcoming budget is going to include $153 million for up to 50 charter schools. Apparently it's going to help lift declining educational performance. And I know education is a bit of a – bugbear for you, so I'm very interested to hear what you've got to say about this. I think that's a fantastic idea. I think charter schools, when they were last running about five or six years ago, they had a military academy type school that had many Pacifica and Maori students that were just kicking butt. They were 
climbing way above the norms for most schools, and they were enjoying school. They had full attendance, and they were achieving massive results. And then the, I think, if I remember rightly, Jacinda Ardern went and visited one of them and was presenting awards to different students for some of the amazing achievements that they had done. Mm. And then the teachers' union later said, oh, no, we're not having that because they're not part of the union. So they closed them down. And I remember thinking the only people being hurt by this are likely to vote Labour. And I thought, wow. That was like it was something that was really going well for them. The students were performing well. They were having record high attendance. And then we shut them down. And instead, no. we thought we'd close schools down and, and the kids could go from home and with COVID and lock them up. doesn't matter that they're not going to get sick of COVID or die from it, but they might give it to granny. So let's lock them up and make sure that no kids go to school and then they can get into the habit of not going to school. And now we've got 50% attendance and the performance would be way down at that level. So I think having these charter schools open up again is fantastic. But the problem I see is if the government changes within the next nine years, and it probably will, no one does three terms well, mm. the third term is the last for sure, in the fourth term they don't get there. So if that happens and the Labour government comes back in and shuts these same schools back down, um, you can only take so much of um, spending all the money and effort and all the things and having plans for um, a school and then have it shut down by the following government, I thought you'd need to somehow put in an irrevocable clause to stop, you know, if they're performing well, to stop them being shut down. But again, they can change the rules of what performing well looks like, and I, I imagine they can shut you down anyway, but that's the, the thing that would stop me from rushing out and becoming a charter school is paying your government and they shut you down. Yeah, I mean, I think the last time uh, it just took too long to get them established um, and it meant that they'd only been in place for about 18 months when when the Labour government came in and it was easy for them to disestablish it. And I think David Seymour's probably learned from that and ensured that uh, there will be a large body of charter schools, not eight or nine, but 50 charter schools, and that's a whole lot of happy parents that will kick up an absolute stink if anybody tried to shut it down and having it in place in the first term of what's what could be a, a two term or a, or a three term government is probably a more sensible approach. But you know, I was, think, I was thinking well, you were mentioning the, about the teachers' unions, and you said that you know they they didn't want the want the schools, and I think one of the things that they said the last time we had charter schools is they didn't like the idea that you could have somebody teaching a class say, on welding, who wasn't a trained teacher. And I would have thought that someone who was a, a really good practical welder, and, you know, you and I know a couple of people that are like that, would be a better person to have in the classroom uh, teaching kids how to use welding equipment than someone who's been to teacher's college for three years. Absolutely. I remember when I was doing my trade cert in um, telecommunications and they were talking about a particular facet and the instructor clearly had never been on the job doing this facet of work mm. because what he said was so wrong and, and I went and saw him afterwards and I said, um, what you've just said there is completely wrong, which shows you've never done it before. So everyone that has done this job knows that what you're saying isn't true. But this is what happens and, and he had egg on his face and he said to me, well, thank goodness you didn't mention it in class, but I'll straighten it up tomorrow. And so the next day in class, he retaught the subject with the correct information. And it was all I could do not to call out in class. But what back to the, the thought that they, um, the, the day that uh, David Seymour has thought about, I see that he's giving 10-year contracts to operate oh, these the charter schools oh. with two rights of renewal for another 10 years making a maximum or minimum, like a 30-year term yep. if you don't muck up. Sounds so like I think a good idea. That might be something that he's done to, to offset that, but that's something that needed to be done, and you need to – and they're also saying they're also that you have to – they're going to do a 
Hero Review, which is the Education Review Office reviewing the sort of curriculum and the way the kids are going. But every time I've had an um, ERO review of the school, the things that they were mattering, which mattered most of them. Now, the school that I'm on the board of is, um, I think it's got two or three European students and out of the mm. 350 kids that go there and the rest are Pacifica, Maori and I think Philippines at the moment are, are starting to go there a bit. But um, the ERO report was more interested in what we were doing for Maori and how we were doing it for Maori. And it took them a while to get their head around that our Maori students were outperforming other Maori students all around the country and our Pacifica students were outperforming other Pacifica students around the country and our kids in general were in the top schools and so that, that they would compete with um, claims and grammar and all these sorts of things. And so that I was trying to say to the Euro people, are you sure you're worrying about the right stuff? Because whether <laughs> yeah. we have got safe spaces for Maori was less important to me than the performance that the kids were getting and how well they were doing. Yeah, and so ex- um, exactly. I see um, in this that they're going to be requiring Euro reports, but I think the Euro needs to get their head around what the charter is so that they can measure it against the charter rather than a set of rules that yeah. they've said uh, sort of woke and likely to keep you broke. I see that um, David Seymour wants to convert 35 state schools to charter schools. Your school might be uh, such a school that might be um, might be able to avail themselves of, of that funding. Um, and we will look into it for sure because there's some um, things there that would, um, that, like you can do a lot, with money you can do a lot. And mm. it's a matter of how, like part, one of the courses that we do for um, our students is teach them in year 12 and 13 how to drive and get a driver's license yeah. so that they've done all the requirements to get their license and many of our students have a driver's license. And um, I had a business that was renting cars to people and many of them would come in their 20s and 30s without a driver's license that was legal to drive by themselves. They might have a blue learners or a yellow restricted, but few had the green full license. And we're trying to get these kids that step on that run so that there's other things that they can do. But we're also getting a lot of them passing university entrance, which of course is we want them to be lifetime learners, like lifelong learners so that you're always learning is really the love of education is what what it's all about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know from discussions with you privately that you are always constantly learning new things, always uh, you have an inquisitive mind. Uh, and most of the blokes uh, that, that we have at lunch are inquisitive people wanting to learn new and different things. Um, that's why we're good at what we do, because we're constantly learning and improving. 100%. So, you yeah. know, and, and you, you're right. Last week, I think you said that the one of the biggest problems we had uh, was that the kids are simply not going to school. If we can just get them to go to school, that, that's going to help them no end. Absolutely. Attendance is was the first problem. And then making the curriculum interesting is the second problem. Like, I've had teachers report to me on the board Mm. in monotone telling me what the the department has achieved. And I've said to them, look, this is too much for me. If you're as interesting to the children as you are to present this report right now, I wouldn't be at all surprised if many of the children have just switched off and gone to sleep. You need to lift your game, man. And, and like people are saying how rude and how harsh I am. But if you can't rep- report to the board in an interesting manner, then you, you're not worth... Um, you know, like how are you trying to keep the interest of young minds, you know, and especially and young men? That's what I said to Lindley. I said the problem we've got in the school system, and it, and I reca- uh, recounted to her some of the things teachers had said to me in my reports, and, you know, I just laughed them off at the time because I thought the teacher was stupid, and he was. But, uh, but he said the things that I needed to hear. Uh, and sometime after I left school, uh, and you know, in between there and my kids going to school and your kids going to school, 
all of a sudden you couldn't tell kids that they were um, that they were a little bit thick or they weren't trying hard or they weren't attending school. And so they would be sent home with these reports that would wax lyrical about some uh, something that the kid could do well, uh, but not actually about the things that they didn't do well. And so they've gone through the schooling system thinking that it's all happy hockey sticks. They've left school and then reality, has smacked them in the face and once they've started to work and they get told that it's substandard or you need to try harder or um, look, you best not darken the door of this office anymore because you're not fit for for a man or beast in any sort of uh, occupation within the uh, confines of this building. And they've never been told that before and it's a real shock to them. What I've found with a few of them because I've been mentoring some young men in a young enterprise group Mm. That they they rock up to their fortieth interview and they're not even getting a reply. And I was saying to them, in many cases in life, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So go and see these people, and here's something that can go with you. And say, um, and so at least you get an interview and a reply. And suddenly, some of these folk have got jobs. And I'm saying it's a tough, tough system out there. But unless you're starting to become the best of the best with your report and the best of the best with your schooling, unless you can dress yourself properly and look the part and then ask intelligent questions of your employer, why would he employ you as opposed to the other 50 applicants? And clean and your damn shoes. Some of these guys have... <laughs> yes, and, and have clean shoes, 100%. And, and these guys are all looking and thinking that what are you on? And then they give it a go and then they're coming and back and saying, oh, can you help me here? Can you help me there? And so I'm helping them with their resume so that when they go there, it's catchy and it's got some points in it that might make an employer say, this guy's worth taking a risk on. I mean, if you get someone turn up to an interview and yes, they've got a tie on and they've got a jacket on, but they haven't uh, tie, you know, tied their tie with a Windsor knot, and their shoes are scuffed on the toes, and the trousers aren't ironed, and the jackets are skew and got dandruff all over the shoulders. You're not going to employ them, are you? You're less likely, absolutely. And if some, it's like the story where the bloke um, gets this suit made for him by a poor tailor, and it's got one arm holding up this way and one leg crooked that way, and another bloke go walks past and says. See, that Taylor's done an amazing job. Imagine trying to fit that bloke. But <laughs> some people make a good suit look like rubbish. And so it's a matter of the, the first thing you have to do is learn how to dress yourself so you look a bit corporate. And the people that can succeed often and the people that can't wonder why. Well, the, it's the old saying, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not in charter schools. <laughs> no. And on that note, Paul, i better go to Jack. He's waiting uh, on the line. And uh, we'll talk again next week. All good. Take care. Bye for now. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jack. Good to have you back. Thank you. How are you, Cam? I'm good. What about yourself? Uh, I've been better, but I'm okay. Yeah, that's good. Hey, at your age, every day above ground is a good day, isn't it? You go to more funerals than you do weddings, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you see the news on Tuesday that the government is uh, going to provide $153 million in the budget so that they can set up 50 charter schools, 15 new ones, and convert 35 state schools to charter schools? And I'm interested in what you think about that. Well, of course I did, because I'm a newsaholic. Um, well, <laughs> Firstly, I think that education is the key to everything in society if you want to succeed. And we've got two problems, I, I believe. The first is that we've got far too many people going to university when they could be in more productive sectors of society. And secondly, a worse problem is we've got far too many people that aren't getting e any education at all. And when I look at, I don't know much about the charter schools, but when I look at what I do know, is that they seem to have a military aspect of it. And I like this because when I was educated way back in the late 50s and early 60s, New Zealand had, well, they did in the South Island anyway, uh, they had a, a military aspect to 
the program in that the first two weeks at uh, high school, you were in the military. You had military uniforms. You went out, you learned military stuff, you learned how to shoot rifles and um, how to do all sorts of stuff that the Army did. And I loved it. And then, then every Wednesday, you would have more military stuff. It, Wednesday afternoon was devoted right through uh, every year to military training. I bet you and enjoyed brain gun practice. I, I've already told you, but I, <laughs> for your listeners, <laughs> that's, that's another time that I got six of the best when caning was allowed. Um, and it was my turn to shoot the bring and I think we were at 300 yards. And uh, we were told to uh, only fire in bursts of three, otherwise we'd overheat the barrel. Yeah. And just at the moment I began, when, when we got the command to shoot, no headphones, of course, in those days, hence the reason I'm now deaf as a post, a hare just happened to pop up the hill. <laughs> uh, and everyone said, get him. And so I remember watching this trail of shots going up after the hare as <laughs> it was gallivanting up the hill, and I let the whole 27 rounds go, for which I received six of the best, and quite rightly so. I don't think I ruined the barrel, but whatever. You don't ruin. And you're going to ask, the, did I get the hair? Yeah, did you get the hair? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was so intrigued with the trail of, of bullets, you know, leaving dust marks that went up. I was I just loved it, and I just <laughs> followed it up there, and I didn't have the heart to actually shoot it. <laughs> the, the the only thing better than magazine fed automatic weapons is belt fed automatic weapons. Yes, yeah. Well, but, I don't yeah. think the bring gun to belt feed well, mechanism. The, yeah, the Bren gun, it, see, the thing is, is they're designed to take about um, 200, 250, 300 rounds before you change the barrel. But they came with two barrels. Yep. And they're designed to do that. It takes you all of about 10 seconds to change the barrel on a Bren gun, and you drop the hammer again yes, and let, let, loose, let loose the next 30 rounds. Yeah, well, I know everything about, well, I knew everything about the Bren gun. I'm a bit out of practice at the moment, but after five minutes of instruction, I'm sure I'd be as good as I ever was. But anyway, getting back to the charter schools, I don't know much about them, but I love the concept. And hey, what the heck? It's better than what's happening now because, quite frankly, the education system in this country is not good. No, it's not good. And so, you know, uh, anything that in my book that upsets the unions, especially the teacher unions, and anything that upsets yep. the Labor Party is a good policy. And charter yeah, schools anything fix that. that says that all teachers are equal to other teachers. teachers we all know, when we look back, who the good teachers were. I can remember and name the few teachers that were so good, and I can't remember for the life of me the bad ones. Oh, I remember the bad ones, and I can't name a good one, but I remember the bad ones oh, really? for sure. Oh, yeah. But, I, I mean, maybe I just had a bad bunch of teachers, but, you know, going to one of the best schools in New Zealand, you would have thought they were better than they were, but my experience of, of teachers was mostly they were stupid. My first teacher I can remember was Mr. Bock. Now, I think he was the grandfather of um, the cricket um, Stephen guy. Bock. And, in fact, and I remember seeing that guy, um, cause, but I also, um, when he was a child, but Mr. Bock, I can remember, he came back from World War II. We learned all the songs that um, they knew in the Army, and he was just, a great inspirational teacher, and I remember it to this day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I remember uh, one teacher I had at school, and he was in bomber command in World War Two. So you know, yep. they were actually th these blokes that were teaching us back then were proper blokes uh, that had done manly things. Yes. And uh, yes. you, if they said they were going to cane you, and they did, you knew about it, and you and you started to think, well, you know. Yeah, I'm not really kind of keen on that. Um, you know, with the with the whippy canes and the strong forearms or back back, you know, the backhand if they were particularly good at it. Um, and you learned, uh, don't do stupid things, otherwise you get caned. Yes. Yep. But you you never let off twenty seven rounds in the Bren gun again, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> there you go, fast learner. <laughs> All right, Charter Schools is Great a big time. plus from you, Jack. Excellent. Yes, sure is. All can't, right, well, we'll talk again next week. Any worse than what we're doing now? No, we can't. We can't do any worse than what we're doing yep. now. Yes. 
All right. We'll talk again next week, Jack. Thanks very much. Okay. Good to to hear from you. Bye. Okay. See you. The current school system isn't delivering, and I think charter schools could be the way to go. And so do my buddies. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You've heard the words open, fair, both sides of the story. It's easy to say them, but practicing them often seems like a bridge too far. New Zealand, it's time for a reality check. Reality check. RCR, Reality Check Radio. Rational discussion, common sense, and open debate for real. With me, Paul Brennan. You know, you just can't make this stuff up. You couldn't write the script. Veteran broadcaster Peter Williams. Where is the evidence they actually make a difference? It turns out that was a very fair question to ask. Taking on the mainstream, Chantel Baker. Mainstream media, as usual, in their little perch. The man who cares so much and whose background is for real, Rodney Hyde. The doctors don't believe them. They can't get ACC. They can't work. They're told it's all in their head. Along with a raft of contributors to inform, entertain and bring the truth back to New Zealand media. It's time for a reality check, all right. RCR, Reality Check Radio at www.realitycheck.radio. We've arrived. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 2057. So get in touch with us now. That's it for The Crunch this week. We have managed to squeeze a fair bit into the show this week. Rachel Stewart is always a delight to talk to. We may not see eye to eye on everything. Hell's tea, she used to be a Labour Party candidate. But what we discussed today, we are absolutely in alignment on. And she's dead right in that blokes need to step up and not hold back from the debate about protecting women's spaces from men suffering a delusion that they are women. Shane Jones was hilarious and serious all at the same time. I enjoy having him on the show because he just cuts through all the BS and speaks the truth. And Simon O'Connor was yet again an absolute delight to have back on the show. And this is why Reality Check Radio exists, so we can share these interesting characters with you all. I learn plenty from my guests, and you can too. You can keep up with all my shows, and indeed all of our shows, by using the RCR app. You can even use the app to stream live. And there's a big upgrade on the go at the moment, so you should see some improvements in the app. And a big thanks to the team that put together the show and make it all work. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I'm loving all your feedback and really enjoying talking to so many people, sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. So a big shout out to all of you. Thank you for listening and having faith in me as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. Don't forget email suggestions to inbox at Reality Check Radio for people for me to interview or topics that you may be interested in. And let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. I look forward to having you join me again next week for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.